With the massive success of Saints Row 2, Volition finally had everyone's attention, and fans of the first two games in the series were waiting to see what they'd do next with a third title. Expectation and pressure began to weigh on the shoulders of the Illinois-based studio. Now that the world's eyes were on them, Volition needed to keep up the momentum. Saints Row the Third began development in 2008 under the working title of Saints Row 3. With staff feeling sapped of creativity, they found themselves throwing ideas at a wall and seeing what stuck. For the first six months of development, Volition tested a concept for Saints Row 3 where the game was going to be choice-based, possibly something like a Telltale game. For obvious reasons, that idea was dropped. I also find it funny that they were trying to rehash a plot about an undercover agent in the Saints when they clearly needed to finish up Troy's story arc, but I digress. Anyways, the idea was scrapped six months into development and the studio needed to come up with something fast. In an effort to get their creativity flowing, the team did the same thing they did when coming up with ideas for Saints Row 1. They put together their own music video. The music video contained clips from movies like Bad Boys 2, which is a classic by the way, and other action films. The song they used was Kickstart My Heart by Motley Crue. The purpose of the music video was to help the team find a personality for Saints Row 3. With Saints Row 1 having a grounded and down-to-earth tone in the backdrop of the inner city, and Saints Row 2 going for more of an action movie-esque feel, the goal of Saints Row the Third was to make it look, play, and feel over the top in order to give it an identity in the now crowd field of sandbox games. In a 2011 interview with gaming website Sponge, Greg Donovan, senior producer for Saints Row 2 and 3, was asked about the reason for such a radical shift in tone in Saints Row the Third, and he answers as follows, quote, With Saints Row the Third, we're doing a complete reboot of the franchise, with new technology and everything else. Everything's gonna be over the top this time around. It works for us, it differentiates us from other open world games, we do it well, and players love it. End quote. Donovan wasn't lying about that because Saints Row 3 is over the top. Saints Row 2 pushed the envelope a bit when it came to the wild things you'd see and do in that game, but at the least it was still grounded and still knew when to pump the brakes. Saints Row 3, on the other hand, shreds the envelope completely. Going from gang wars in the mean streets of the inner city to an entire conflict with a paramilitary unit that uses futuristic weapons is quite the tonal whiplash. Saints Row the Third is the most polarizing game in the franchise amongst fans, and right Hopefully so. Many love it and many hate it. Those whom love the game praise it for all the crazy things you could do in and out of combat, its insane story, setting, and characters, the customization, and the off-the-wall humor. Those who hate the game don't like it because of the sudden shift in tone, the story not tying up any loose ends, gameplay feeling inferior to the second game, and the scaled-back customization options. Me personally, I'm a bit mixed when it comes to Saints Row the Third. I love stuff like the gunplay, the crazy outfits you get to wear, the new activities, you know, stuff like that. But the the game's story and even its setting leaves a lot to be desired. Even though this was the first game in the franchise I got to seriously sit down and play, I still find myself preferring Saints Row 1 and 2 over this game. With Stillwater having been the setting of Saints Row twice by now, it was definitely time for something new. Saints Row the Third takes place in the city of Steelport, which is based off of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is made clear with the numerous steel factories and chemical plants littered throughout the metropolis, and some even being found in residential areas. Steelport was also modeled after cities in the Rust Belt region of America, a region where the steel industry once flourished but is now home to abandoned factories, population loss, and urban decay. Think of places like Gary, Indiana, for example. One other thing the designers borrowed from the city of Pittsburgh were the segmented islands being connected by the various bridges. Despite all this, Steelport itself feels more bland than Stillwater, but I'm going to save that for when it's time to talk about the open world. With the Saints being new in town, the gangs of Steelport aren't going to welcome them with open arms. In this game, the gangs are more over the top and less like the ones from previous titles. What's also different about these crews is that they're all working together under one conglomerate. This conglomerate is called the Syndicate, so instead of different crews across the city fighting each other for control, it's now them versus you. The first gang is known as the Morningstar, and they're run by Syndicate leader Philippe Loren. These guys' main source of income is prostitution and human trafficking. They're usually seen wearing black suits, although the women in this gang wear lingerie alongside a duster coat. Without spoiling too much, this gang and Philippe himself are huge missed opportunities. That's all I'll say about them for now. Next are the Deckers. This crew is run by 16-year-old Matt Miller, making
making him the youngest antagonist in the series. The Deckers specialize in cyber crimes, stuff like emptying bank accounts, unleashing viruses, pretty much any tech-related crime you can think of. Out of all rival crews, their designs are my favorite. These guys are going for the cyber goth aesthetic, with their clothing emitting a bright blue neon and crew members sporting painted nails, heavy makeup, and dyed hair. Their vehicles have some of the best designs in the game too. I think it's safe to say that the Deckers have the best drip here in Saints Row 3. And finally, the last rival crew is the Luchadors, run by Mexican wrestler Eddie Kilbane Pryor. From what I've gathered, the Luchadors specialize in dealing steroids and I guess gambling? All of these guys are decked out in wrestling and tactical gear, and they love to drive around these huge trucks. These guys are pretty much the brotherhood if they had the backing of a huge criminal empire, and no, that thing with Ultor does not count. The cast for this game is star-studded. You've got returning cast members such as Ken Michael, the voice for Male Voice 2 in the last game, Daniel Dai Kim, whom reprises his role as Johnny Gat, and RFS Kinchin coming back to play as Pierce. And then you've got the heavy hitters. Hulk Hogan, yes, THE Hulk Hogan, voices wrestler Angel De La Muerte. Yuri Lowenthal of Naruto and Persona fame voices Matt Miller. Adult film star Sasha Gray voices Viola De Winter. Megan Hollingshead, who voiced Rangiku from Bleach, plays as Kiki De Winter. Troy Baker voices Male Voice 1, Laura Bailey plays as Female Voice 2, and Natalie Lander from Fire Emblem Fates voices Kinsey Kensington. I know that I missed a lot, but there are just so many to go over. On November 15, 2011, Saints Row III was released in the United States and Australia. Europe would get the game just three days later on the 18th of November. Saints Row III sold incredibly well, selling more than 5 million copies in total, and it received universal praise from critics and audiences alike. For a lot of people, this was their first Saints Row game, including me, as I got the game that year and then I played the series backwards. I vividly remember my brother and I taking turns playing this game on my dad's old launch day 360. Which, by the way, I'm honestly surprised it didn't give us a red ring for all the years we had it. Rest in peace to that thing, it died in late 2012 after the disc reader stopped working. In May of 2019, eight years after the launch of Saints Row 3, it would get a port on the Nintendo Switch. The Switch port was handled by German company Fish Labs. This port actually flew under my radar for a while. I didn't even find out that there was a Switch version until I ran into it at a GameStop later that year. PS4, Xbox One, and PC users would have to wait one more year before they could get their hands on a full-blown remaster, which released in May of 2020. It's got a lot of new and touched up visuals and contains all the DLC. I've got a couple gripes with this version. One, they took the easy route by adding a bunch of reflection and lens flare, you know, I guess trying to make it look quote unquote modern. And another thing is that they added a bunch of new models and some look good, some look bad, others just look questionable. I, I don't know, man. My biggest gripe with this version, however, is the fact that you still can't replay cutscenes and missions. For this video, I'm going to be playing the remastered version on PlayStation 4. One more thing, the remasters have some really odd glitches, glitches that to this day have yet to be patched, so if my character is acting weird when getting into cars, that's the game glitching out, not me doing that. There's also this really weird glitch where one of the analog sticks will start drifting out of nowhere. I actually panic too because this purple controller is my favorite, and you know how they stay overcharging for new controllers. The reason for the drift is because of an odd glitch with the controller dead zoned, and of course, as of me recording, there's been no patch for this. Thanks for the free heart attack, Spirisoft. With the Saints finding themselves in Steelport, they've gotta find a way to survive in a city that wants them dead. It's time to lock, load, and show these other crews that we mean business. Saints Row the Third begins with a text crawl. After the events of the second game, the Third Street Saints have gone on to evolve from an inner city street gang to a media empire slash criminal organization. A movie about the Saints is in the works, and the leader and their lieutenants are now pop culture icons. With the Saints being on top of the world, every criminal organization wants to snatch their crown. It was only a matter of time before someone decided to take the fight to them. The game then cuts to a scene of a man getting the absolute piss beat out of him by like 15 other dudes. No really, they're going to work on this guy. Like what did he do to y'all to warrant this? Fight back, nigga! Fight back, nigga! Fight back! 
All of a sudden, he takes a sip of energy drink and then proceeds to destroy everyone that was just beating on him. Turns out that this was just a commercial for the Saints energy drink, Saints Flow. We're then brought to a room where the Saints themselves are all getting ready to pull off a bank robbery. Oh yeah, and from here on, I'm gonna refer to my character as Boss. Shandi, Boss, and Gat have brought along a method actor named Josh Burke. The reason he's with us is because he's researching his role and he's acting as a ride-along so that he can better prepare for his part in the upcoming movie. Boss walks in wearing the disguise they've prepared and assures Josh that this ride-along's gonna help. Instead of starting the game off with character creation, the game throws you in head first with your character being cleverly disguised until it's time for them to come to life. It kind of throws old players for a loop, but it's the dev's way of having the game start off with the opening incident first, before moving on to create a character. Reminds me of how Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls throws you into character creation before the game starts, and then Dark Souls 2 starts off with your character in disguise until they reach the old ladies. Anyways, the robbery starts, and it's nothing special. The saints are just holding up the place without any drama. Josh is hassling one of the bank tellers, and he criticizes the crew for not being more assertive, and then that teller pulls out a gun and tries shooting Josh. The rest of the tellers all have heat on them, and the saints are quickly forced to go on the offensive, resulting in a shootout between the saints and the bank itself. The shooting in this game is similar to how it was in Saints Row 2, just with some changes. For starters, the player can finally go into Fineaim by holding down one of the shoulder buttons instead of turning it on and off with the right thumbstick. Secondly, there's now hit markers, which alone makes the gameplay look and feel all the more satisfying. It feels nice seeing feedback from the UI and the enemy I'm shooting, letting me know that I've landed a shot on them. Guns in this game now have an auditory cue that lets you know you're running low on ammo, and this is usually heard when you're down to the last few shots of whatever gun you're using. You can now dive while sprinting, which which is good for widening the gap between you and your enemies, and it's also good for dodging debris that's coming your way. The human shield feature from the last game makes a return, and it's pretty much unchanged. Approach some unfortunate soul that happens to be nearby, grab them, and have them absorb all the damage that you would have taken until they inevitably die. And yes, you can still toss them dozens of meters away. Another new improvement is that you no longer have to switch to grenades in your weapon wheel if you want to use one. Instead, using grenades is mapped to one of the shoulder buttons, and what's also cool is that you can utilize more than one type of grenade and quickly switch between each type using the D-pad while the weapon wheel is open. The overall gunplay in Saints Row the Third feels just right. As for melee combat, there's been a massive downgrade in that area. The melee in Saints Row 1 amounted to nothing but flailing at each other until someone went down. Melee in Saints Row 2 feels like it has purpose and rewards the player for maintaining combo strings by having them cap it all off with one big finishing move. On top of that, there's four different fighting styles you can play around with. Melee in Saints Row 3, I'm not a big fan of. You're back to using one fighting style again, and the basic three-hit combo lacks any payoff. Despite the lack of payoff, your punches are way too powerful, and enemies do little to protect themselves. There's also too much weight behind each punch thrown. The unique melee animations are still there, but you've got to trigger them yourself instead of pulling them off through combo strings. You can do this by sprinting up to an enemy and hitting the melee button at the right time, or by standing next to an enemy and hitting the left trigger. The latter will put you into a quick time event, and if the buttons are pressed on time, each hit will do more damage. I honestly don't see the point in doing any of these because it's impractical. It puts you in a lot of danger. If you do this to one enemy near a group of their allies, all you'll end up doing is taking gunfire until the QTE is over. One worthwhile melee attack is, believe it or not, hitting the enemy square in the crotch by clicking down on the right thumbstick. I am not joking. The reason this is so useful is because it stuns enemies and leaves them vulnerable. This is good for when an enemy is too close for you to shoot and you need to create more space between the both of y'all. Also, Volition put way too much work into all the different animations for annihilating someone's crotch. You even get a trophy for doing this too. The melee weapons aren't any better, as all of them feel the same and they suffer the same issue as bare knuckles, with each melee weapon being overpowered and having too much weight behind each shot. So yeah, 
melee in Saints Row the Third, it's not good. After clearing out the lobby, the Saints head toward the back with the goal of reaching the vault. It starts becoming clear to these guys that this is no ordinary bank. The employees are all packing heat, and the bank is designed like a palace. Right off the bat, I find it really odd that the Saints, being native to Stillwater, had no idea about this bank and who owns it prior to the heist. You mean to tell me that the guys who took over Stillwater don't even know about what's going on in their own backyard? The Saints make it to the vault, but there's no way they can get it open. It's time for plan B, and that means detonating multiple explosives above the vault and having a helicopter lifted out of the building. The explosives go off, and the crew is about to call in their chopper, and then Josh ruins the entire heist. Let's get the chopper and lift this baby out of here. Hey guys, you can call up the helicopter. Found the way to open the vault. Don't touch it! Josh, are you trying to get us all jail time? What? I don't want to be some dude's bitch. Do I have to go after him? Forget about it, he'll be fine. While we wait for the chopper to arrive, we have to hold our ground against a whole army of SWAT dudes. After burning through these guys, an attack chopper shows up, but it's quickly dispatched. Our escort arrives, and Boss attaches the cables to the vault, and we're out of here. The game then puts us into a turret section where we have to fend off enemies while the pilot tries lifting the vault and flying away from the bank. We're being attacked by wave after wave of enemies and more attack helicopters as the pilot struggles to fly us in the opposite direction. The helicopter moves to another side of the building, and Boss continues fending off more enemies. Another attack chopper is taken down, but it flies towards us and crashes into the helicopter holding on to the vault. Boss jumps back onto the building, but he's quickly surrounded by SWAT and arrested. We're then brought to the character creation screen. Before customizing your character, you're given a choice of which base model you want to start with, which is a pretty nice way of giving players an idea of what they want for their character. The variety for character customization in this game is explosively huge. New hairstyles, more options for makeup and scars, better taunts and compliments, and you can go absolutely crazy with colors. The voices this time around are Caucasian, African American and British for males, and Caucasian, Eastern European, and Hispanic for females. The police throws us into a cell, and we're told that someone with more money paid them off. Johnny starts lamenting about what the Saints have turned into. He feels like they've become sellouts with all the corporatization and merchandising. What happened? We got arrested. No, to us. Burke's right. We traded our dicks in for pussies. Seriously. Movie deals, commercials, Saint's name used to mean something more than body spray and some ass tasting energy drink. The conversation is cut short when a group of armed men enter the cell. The women leading them says that their employer wishes to speak with the Saints. On an airplane, the Saints are tied up and they're speaking to a man named Philippe Loren, who goes on to introduce his assistant as Viola and Kiki. Loren is the chairman of the Syndicate, a multinational criminal organization. The Saints have no idea who the Syndicate is, but it turns out that the bank they tried robbing was owned by them. The reason Loren hasn't killed us yet is because the Syndicate is expanding into Stillwater and he wants to cut a deal with the Saints. Okay, time out. As I've stated earlier, the Saints pretty much own all of Stillwater, especially with them going corporate by the time the events of this game starts. So you mean to tell me that the Syndicate have been operating in Stillwater long enough to run a bank and the Saints knew nothing about it? And on top of that, why rob a bank? The Saints are pretty much like Disney at this point, so why go and do something like that when you're already making presumably millions of dollars yearly? Especially since y'all have a movie on the way. It's just, I, I don't know, man. The setup to this game's story is really contrived. Anyways, the Saints are given an offer. They can still operate the Saints Ultor Media Group, but they have to give up 66% of their monthly gross revenue to the Syndicate. And that's before taxes. Negotiations play out exactly as you'd expect. Listen, you French fuck. Please, I am Belgian. So make yourself a fucking waffle. We done here. And I had so hoped to come to a rational business arrangement. Oh. 
Shondi and Boss are freed from their bindings, but they need to come up with a plan. Johnny's gonna take control of the plane and fly it back to Stillwater while we clear everyone out. Shondi and Boss kill their way to the cargo hold, and they need to find a parachute so that they can jump out of the plane. Wait a minute, I thought we were flying this back to Stillwater. Which is it? As we make our way through, Gat can be heard on the intercom struggling with Loren. We're finally at the end of the cargo hold, and what you're about to witness is the most controversial scene in the franchise. Johnny, we're about to jump! Right on. I'll see you in still. Johnny? Wow. It's been, what, less than 30 minutes into the runtime, and they've already killed off Gat. What makes Gat's death so irritating is how it happens super early in the game, and the fact that he dies off screen. I don't think that anyone, including myself, would have had a problem with Gat dying if he had more screen time and if his death had some emotional and narrative payoff. So I know many of you are wondering, why? Why do this to such a beloved character? Well, the answer isn't too complicated, really. In a video posted by Volition themselves, Steve Jaros, the main writer, gives us a straight answer. Uh, Why'd you kill Johnny? What? Why did you kill Johnny? Uh, he, he, he didn't, originally, uh, like, original, no, 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 I mean, like, originally, he wasn't supposed to die. I don't like, know. At the first, no, no, there's a version of the game where he yeah. lived the entire way through. Yeah. And then THQ, um, said they wanted me to kill Johnny. I so Gat was, huh. Gat was forced to compete, and you mm -hmm. rescue Gat from yeah, yeah, this yeah, yeah. competition, and yeah. then he's all geared up for revenge, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then people, people were like, we needed to have more, um, we need to have more like emotional weight. Like, what did we tell Johnny Gat? Yes, you heard correctly. This wasn't the fault of the writers. The reason Gat died was because of interference from THQ. The fact that they had him die so early because they thought it'd give the story more emotional weight is laughable. If Gat had to die, then they should have allowed the writers to give him more time to shine. To steal a joke from the notorious KTB or whoever else said this, the dude died faster than Chris Brown did at the beginning of Stomp the Yard. Getting back on track, Shondi and Boss are forced out of the plane, but Boss loses Shondi and has to shoot his way past more of Loren's goons. This is actually one of my favorite shootouts in the game from the presentation alone. Stuff like bullets speeding past you, shell casings flying upwards, enemies getting sent back up when they die. This is a pretty dope gunfight. You can also change the position of your body so that you can aim at enemies that are just out of reach. Boss makes it to Shondi in time and opens up the parachute. The two let out a sigh of relief, but there's one big problem. What's that thing? What is what? Okay, it's nothing to freak out over, but that plane looks like it's gonna try to ram us. What do you mean, don't freak out? Do you have a plan? If I shoot out the window, I can land inside it, cap Philippe, then jump out the back. You mean we, right? I'll be back in a minute. Wait, what? Ah! Shoot out the window? <gasps> what the fuck was I thinking? Well, Boss's plan kinda worked. He couldn't find Philippe, but he was able to retrieve another parachute. We're back to shooting more dudes and dodging debris until we catch up to Shondi again, and she's understandably pissed. In the meeting room, Loren gets the other gang leaders on a video call and tells them that negotiations didn't go so well. Loren's two associates will let the city know that the Saints aren't welcome in Steelport. Kilbane is ordered to hunt down the Saints, and Matt Miller is ordered to drain their bank accounts and leave them financially crippled. This play is so that the Saints will be weakened upon setting foot here. Once the duo walks away from the ATM, Loren calls Boss and says that Gat's body will serve as a warning for those who dare challenge the Syndicate. We're also told to not mourn Gat for long, since we'll be joining him soon. Well, welcome to Steelport. This is where we'll be spending the entire game. Boss and Shondi hop into a car and make their way to a friendly fire. Shondi's actually been here before on spring break, but she doesn't remember much of the city because she was really high. With the Saints being new in town, they need to get some firepower. So Boss decides that they're gonna raid an armory on a National Guard base in town. Dude, you just got here. Shondi also texted Pierce and let him know what's up, and he's bringing the crew along. We arrive at Friendly Fire, and Shondi hands over some leftover cash she had on her. At Friendly Fire in this game, you can now upgrade your weapons. It's the typical stuff. Better damage, accuracy, firing rate, you know the deal. 
Pro tip, if you're looking to use pistols, use the KA-1 Cobra. It has a way better firing rate than the 45 Shepard. After getting what we need from Friendly Fire, we head to the National Guard base and kill our way toward the armory. The duo comes across a huge bomb, and Boss decides that he's gonna take it. Once inside the armory, the game needs us to hold our positions until Pierce and the rest of the crew shows up. Our backup is finally here, and these dudes rain down a ton of gunfire on the helpless soldiers below. We're then given control of these UAV drones, and we can fire two missile types, Guided and Dumb. Guided missiles allow the player to control the direction of the rocket up until the moment of impact. Dumb missiles are just fired without any control from the player. <laughs> What's also pretty cool about the UAV drone is that it can be used anytime and anywhere in the open world. Personally, it's not the type of weapon I'd find myself using, even in a heated gunfight in the middle of the streets. Anyways, we've got to protect these helicopters with the UAV by wiping out enemy vehicles. Once the cargo is loaded up, Boss hops on Pierce's helicopter, and he and Shondi now have to fend off their pursuers and protect the bomb that they stole. We finally arrive at our safe house, and all is good. I also forgot to mention that this safe house was given to us by yet another ex of Shondi's. When deciding what their next move is, Boss suggests that Shondi should go back to Stillwater for her own safety, but she refuses and says that she's doing all this for Johnny. It's kind of odd that Shondi is the only one in this cutscene concerned about getting revenge for Gat. In the last game, they barely spoke to each other. I'm also surprised at how nonchalant Boss is about losing Gat. You know, the guy he's been with since the first game? I get that he's lost a lot of comrades along the way, and he's used to it, but Boss just lost a close friend. Hell, his best friend. Pierce should also be out for blood in the name of Johnny as well. He had a ton of scenes with Gat during the Ronin arc, so I don't see why he's not fired up after hearing about his death. It's also implied that sometime between the second and third game, Gat and Shondi became really close friends. I can kind of see how the non-linear mission structure from the first two games can have an impact on character relationships. Carlos's death could be seen miles away, because he never appears in cutscenes for the Ronin and Samdi arcs. My point is that if the mission structure of Saints Row 1 and 2 were more linear, said linearity would allow relationships between characters to be more natural, and the weight from major deaths would be felt by more than one or two people in the cast. It's kind of a double-edged sword. You want to give the player more freedom in deciding which part of the story they want to take on first, but this has the adverse effect of creating some really jarring moments. Once this mission is over, the game finally allows us to run freely around Steelport. Compared to Stillwater, the city of Steelport is a huge downgrade. Steelport's biggest problem is that it's really bland in terms of visuals and layout. There aren't many locales that stand out except for the downtown area. Despite Steelport being made up of segmented islands, none of these islands have anything that gives each one its own unique identity. Even though Stillwater was made up of two islands, every district felt distinct, like they served a purpose, and they all looked and felt alive. The North Island was the upscale portion of Stillwater, being home to the suburbs, downtown, the museums, and high-end stores. The South Island was more run-down yet still residential. Being home to dangerous neighborhoods such as Shivington and Sunnyvale Gardens, you'd come across abandoned and dilapidated buildings on each block, beaten up cars, and random gunfights breaking out. Yet on that same island, there were also places like Chinatown, the Factory District, and Stillwater University. My point is that Stillwater has a ton of varied and memorable locales. As for Steelport, this place just looks and feels dead. Outside of downtown and Sunset Park, I can't even begin to remember much about the other neighborhoods. This city is boring and it feels like a lot more could have been done with it. Give each island its own character. For example, Kilbane has his own casino, so why not make the surrounding area a hotbed for gambling? You know, throw in some expensive retail stores, relevant activities, and a ton of other casinos in the area. The De Winter Sisters have their own BDSM club, so why not make the neighborhood that it's in a neon-drenched red light district, with brothels and strip clubs lining the streets and having prostitutes spawn more frequently in that area? Having stuff like that makes your map more memorable to players in not just the sentimental sense, but a practical sense as well. The pedestrians in this game aren't any better. None of their dialogue changes as the story progresses, and their actions and gestures aren't even unique. Loren says that he doesn't want the saints feeling welcome here, but the world and people around us don't echo that. Nobody's insulting us or even making any remarks about the situation we're in. In Saints Row 1 and 2, pedestrian dialogue changed depending on where you were at in the story, making you feel like a local celebrity of some sort. 
As if Steelport weren't bland enough, there's no dynamic weather system and the time of day stays the same until you die, load up a save, or finish an activity or mission. It's incredibly strange that they took something like that out. So how's the driving? The driving in Saints Row 3? Well, it's serviceable. Vehicles often feel either too light or too heavy when accelerating, and completing sharp turns means that you have to hit the emergency brake a lot. When you get into a collision, your car and the one you crashed into will both feel like Hot Wheels toys because the impact will either send the other car into the stratosphere or send you flying instead. The developers must have finally realized that using the face buttons to drive was a dumb idea, especially this late into the 7th generation, so the default control scheme uses the shoulder buttons instead. Not much has changed with the drive-by controls, it's the same as last time. So all in all, the driving in this game is a mixed bag. One new feature has been added, and this is called Bodukan. It's a maneuver where you can take control of a vehicle by jumping in from the side windows or the front windshield. It's as crazy as it looks. It's also really a efficient for quickly getting into a car when you're in a hurry and don't want to sit through the regular animation for entering vehicles. The radio stations this time around are an improvement over the ones in Saints Row 2. Instead of throwing every chart-topping artist at the time into each station, Volition decided to take a step back and add in lots of underground and indie artists while also mixing in mainstream acts. The older stations themselves have shifted in terms of genres a little. Gen X 89 now plays indie alongside pop punk. K Rhyme plays nothing but rap and hip hop, meaning there's no more RB here. K 12 went from electro punk to dubstep, which is appropriate given how dubstep was catching on in the early 2010s. And Mix 107 plays a mix of grunge, synth pop, and old school hip hop. There are now three new stations Cabron 104.2, Blood 106.66, and Adult Swim WDDTCPDG. Yes, it's really called that. Cabron plays reggaeton, the Adult Swim station plays songs from different Adult Swim shows, and Blood 106 plays nothing but different flavors of metal. And in case you're wondering, my favorite stations in this game are Gen X 89, K Rhyme, K 12, and Blood 106. Also, huge shout out to the sound team for adding Wale to K Rhyme's lineup for the second time in a row. Although, I will say that if they were gonna pick a track off of Attention Deficit, they should have added Pretty Girls instead. The way that custom music is handled is pretty much the same as last time, except all songs from each station are available at the start. You no longer have to go to the record store and buy the CD. I can kind of see why they did this. By the early 2010s, music distribution was starting to lean more towards digital, but CDs weren't totally dead yet. Hell, I still collect CDs to this very day. The cell phone makes a return in this game, but this time there's more focus on it. Instead of driving to a location and starting a new mission, all missions are started from the phone itself. Not only that, but players no longer need to grind for respect points in order to play story missions. Instead, respect points go towards upgrades. Each level you earn will grant you access to a whole swath of upgrades to improve your experience. You'll be able to upgrade health, stamina, damage taken from certain weapons, vehicle abilities, ammo count, and you can purchase some open world bonuses. As nice as these additions to the game are, I never found myself bothering with them too much. Although I highly recommend upgrading stuff like health, stamina, ammo count, damage modifiers, and reload speed. Earning respect points is the same as last time. You get them through actions taken either during combat or while driving. I think it's neat that the devs did more with respect points outside of permitting players access to new missions. Of course, the big drawback to this is, is that players will blaze through the story within hours. That's why I liked how respect functioned in the first two games. It made you go out, explore the city, and kill some time in between story missions. Saints Book is where you can take on Hitman and vehicle theft missions and see what challenges in the open world need to be cleared. Weird. Hitman and Chop Shop have finally been improved in that every single target is guaranteed to spawn. The challenge menu is tied to some of the trophies you earn, with one of the trophies being to complete every single challenge. If you're like me and enjoy trophy hunting, this is a good way of keeping track of which challenges you need to get out of the way. The phone app is pretty self-explanatory. You can call up different kinds of homies to ride with you around Steelport. The Cash app, no not that Cash app, allows you to collect revenue made from portions of the city that have been taken over. This is pretty much like taking out cash from the safe in Saints Row 1 and 2. As the name implies, the cheat menu allows you to enter different cheats and watch the chaos ensue. Be warned though that activating cheats can disable trophies for that specific save file and can turn off autosave, so make sure to save before using any of the cheats. 
And finally, the stat screen allows you to look at records and tallies of everything you've done throughout the game. I'm a huge numbers nerd, so I always get a sense of glee whenever I see something like this in just about anything. As a replacement for pushbacks, you'll now receive random phone calls while you're out in the open world asking you to come over and clear out some enemies. This is called survival. In survival, you'll be taking on enemies that come after you in waves, and you either have to kill a certain amount, or survive for however much time you're given in order to advance to the next wave. These are pretty fun, but I wish notifications for survival showed up in the form of text messages instead of phone calls. When it comes to gang notoriety, there's been a massive overhaul. In the first two games, gang notoriety just meant that there'd be a larger headcount in terms of enemies. Here in Saints Row the Third, higher gang notoriety means that more unique enemies from each gang will show up. With the Morningstar, they'll bring in a helicopter with the sniper trying to take you down, and this guy can get in some really good shots too. It's best to shoot down that helicopter as soon as you can, since that guy can be a huge pain when you're already dealing with a crowd of enemies. The Luchadors will bring in these heavily armored dudes that'll fire off multiple grenades from, well, a grenade launcher. These guys are annoying to deal with, because not only do the grenades deal damage, but they'll leave you stunned for a few seconds until your character regains their balance. And finally, the Deckers will send in these chicks that zoom around at high speeds and will attack boss with this hammer that can send you flying. When they take a break from running around, they'll just fire their submachine guns briefly. That's the absolute best time to shoot them, and when you do come after them, make sure you're using a shotgun, since you want to make every shot count. I think that having each gang spawn a unique enemy does a good job at better establishing an identity for all of them. Not only that, but it gives the player something to worry about the longer they're in a gunfight with one of these crews. That's exactly what the gangs from the first two games needed in terms of notoriety in the open world. Getting back to the story, Pierce calls us and starts complaining that he can't stand the new digs and decides that he wants to ride around Steelport with us to see what it has to offer. We pick up Pierce at a park and he says that we should take the car I'm driving for a tune-up. During the drive, the two reminisce about Gat and we're told that Shandy's taking his death pretty hard. Again, really odd that it's not Pierce who's pissed about Gat dying, but there's no point in beating a dead horse. I never really bothered talking about vehicle customization in the other Saints Row videos, so I guess now's a good time. Not that I'll be speaking at length about it, though. Vehicle customization in Saints Row 3 has a ton of different options when it comes to upgrading your car. You've got various colors, shades, and patterns for visuals, and you can make some improvements to your vehicle's performance. Stuff like nitrous, torque, and tire durability to name a few. Other than that, there's not much else I can say about vehicle customization. Our next destination is a Saints-owned clothing store called Planet Saints. All the clothing stores in this game now offer a bigger and unique selection of clothing. Unfortunately, we've lost some customization features. You can no longer choose different logos for each article of clothing, and you're not allowed to throw on different layers of clothing anymore, and all of the pre-made outfits can't be customized in terms of color. I'm a bit disappointed because it was always nice being allowed to tailor specific articles of clothing to your liking. Stuff like that made everyone's character look and feel unique instead of being forced to wear something the way the game wants you to. Damn, it's fucking raining, man. She gonna fuck up my fucking leather, man. Shit ain't leather, nigga. Fuck you, who the fuck is you, fam? After the duo finish their shopping trip at Planet Saints, they're ambushed by a squad of Morningstar alongside Craig Marduk from Tekken. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is a new enemy type, and they're called Brutes. Brutes are complete bullet sponges, and they're able to close in on your position like it's nothing. Keep a safe distance from these guys, because they can hit you really hard and take away a decent chunk of your health. Once you've riddled them with enough bullets, you have a limited time to run up to them and hit a button prompt to finish them off with a quick time event. If you don't hit the prompt in time, they'll regain half their health and continue their onslaught. Brutes are seen if you raise any gang's notoriety to max. There's more than one type of brute though. There's one brute that wields a minigun, and he won't stop firing until he pauses for a brief period. That's usually the best time to shoot him. These guys are far more dangerous in spaces with little or no cover, because you've got nothing to shield yourself from the volley of bullets once they start firing. Another kind of brute uses a flamethrower, and this one in particular is very annoying to deal with. Since the flamethrower's range isn't that good, this guy has to run up real close to you before he starts using it. Getting set on fire by these guys is irritating because your movement speed is slowed down and you take lots of damage. On top of that, this guy can just keep piling on more and more flames. You can deal damage to the tank on his back, which will explode once you've fired at it enough. 
The duo survive the ambush and retreat back to the safe house. Oh yeah, they've changed the way you remove your notoriety in this game. Instead of driving through a forgive and forget, you now have to walk inside either a club or a store that you've purchased to remove all notoriety. This really takes the bite out of notoriety and makes it feel like a complete joke because instead of forcing the player to rely on their quick wits and fending off pursuers on the way to forgive and forget, now they can just enter any building and enemies will back off. This happens at any level of notoriety too. I'm willing to suspend my disbelief for a lot of things in this series, but you mean to tell me that the city police in one of the biggest criminal empires in the world can't catch one single person because they fled inside of a hot topic? Get real. Up next is my favorite mission in the game, Party Time. Pierce calls us and says that he found a better place that the Saints can use as headquarters, which is a penthouse owned by the Morningstar. Pierce's plan is to crash the party, eliminate all enemies there, and keep the place for the Saints. How they're gonna go about this is by having the Saints wait downstairs until Boss unlocks the elevator and then have them come up to ambush the Morningstar. For Boss to get into the penthouse, what he's gonna do is jump onto the roof from a helicopter and fight his way through until he gets to the elevator. The duo flies over the penthouse and Boss jumps out of the helicopter, landing square on the landing pad. After some searching, Boss eventually finds the guy with the elevator codes and makes his way downstairs. The area is heavily guarded, but it's nothing that Boss can't handle. The Saints are finally let in, and we clear out the rest of these dudes alongside the reinforcements they sent. After sending these guys packing, we run into a problem. Sometime during the raid, one of the Morningstar planted a bomb, and it's set to go off soon. So Boss jumps into a helicopter and chases the guy who knows how to defeat use the bomb. This part of the mission is really tedious because you've got to stay close to this dude in a really slow helicopter chase across the city. The worst part is that if you fail this part of the mission, you've got to do it all over again. Eventually, we corner this guy at some random factory and Shondi gives us a call. Turns out that the bomb doesn't use codes, but you need to cut a certain wire to defuse it. So we've got three minutes to chase this dude down and force him to tell us which wire to cut. Boss finally reaches this guy, and he tells us that we need to cut the red wire. The bomb is defused, and the Saints finally have their own official headquarters in Steelport. At a meeting room in Syndicate HQ, Matt expresses concern about the Saints. Kilbane and Philippe tell Matt to stop worrying about them, but Matt has sent a video on his phone of Boss taking over their penthouse. The Saints now have the undivided attention of the Syndicate. As much as I love Party Time for its presentation and level and mission design, well, at least before the helicopter chase, story-wise, I think this mission happened sooner than it should've. The pacing is just out of control. So the Saints arrive in unfamiliar territory, and already they're doing stuff like picking fights with the National Guard and taking over a penthouse owned by the Syndicate. Not only that, but after the raid on the penthouse, the Syndicate barely does anything about it. Which really begs the question as to why an organization the size of the Syndicate is hardly willing to retaliate after taking a major blow like that. Forget having the home field advantage, the Saints and the Syndicate seem to have that habit of falling victim to their own incompetence in their hometowns. The Saints didn't know that the Syndicate built a large bank on their turf despite being natives to Stillwater, and the Syndicate hardly bothered turning up the heat against the Saints once one of their major properties is raided and stolen from them. Party time should have been reserved for the midway point of the game so that the attack on the penthouse has impact after building up to it. It would serve as a really good turning point in the story for both crews if it was placed in such a spot. On the topic of safe houses, the cribs in this game suck. They're bland, there's nothing about them to explore, and worst of all, you can't customize them, except for the exterior on certain cribs. The lack of customization takes the wind out of owning cribs because almost all of them are the same thing. A massive penthouse or condo with a bar, nightclub, or strip club attached. Weapon, wardrobe, and vehicle customization have all been moved to one single menu, which can be opened from anywhere in the crib. This is pretty neat, but it also ticks away from exploring and looking around your crib as you make your way towards whatever you're trying to find. Not only that, but with the player being able to customize all vehicles from the comfort of any safe house in the game, there's pretty much no point in driving up to a car shop. The next series of missions are from Pierce, and they're really just the game introducing different activities to us. This is going to happen with a couple more characters later in the story, so I'm just going to give a rundown on every single new activity this game has. First up is Guardian Angel. This activity has us protecting an ally on the ground while we're in the air. In the helicopter, we're given an RPG and we have to shoot anyone closing in on our ally. 
Be very careful when firing this thing, because the person you're protecting can also take friendly fire damage, and they can also take damage from explosions from nearby vehicles. Then there's a section where you have to keep that person safe via a sniper rifle. You gotta be quick when picking off targets, and make sure that every shot counts, because while you're reloading, your ally could be taking damage from enemies on the ground. You also gotta play around with zooming the scope in and out, since enemies will spawn from nowhere and ambush the protectee. Guardian Angel's pretty fun, but it can be frustrating because it tends to drag on a lot with so many stops you gotta make and enemy headcount making your head spin while you're manning the sniper. This isn't an activity, but the game gets us reacquainted with buying businesses and earning income from them. As established earlier, any business or crib you own will wipe your notoriety once you set foot in them. Once again, this is completely silly, but I've already said what I said about that. We're also introduced to collectibles, which are pretty self-explanatory. Pierce then has us purchase an apartment building. The thing is that this isn't a crib, it's an investment. Buying a building like this is the same as buying businesses, it increases the income you periodically receive. You also gain control of a small percentage of one of the islands each time you buy these. There's another thing in the open world you can do called gang operations. It's nothing special, you're just wiping out a squad of enemies. That's pretty much it. Next is Tank Mayhem, and it's exactly what the name says. This is pretty much like the mayhem activity from previous games, except, well, you're in a tank. You gotta shoot at random objects to score higher and meet the threshold before the timer runs out. If your combo meter goes down, you have to build it back up again if you want to continue getting high payouts. Overall, this is a pretty fun activity if you're in the mood for mindless chaos. And then there's my favorite activity, Professor Genki's Super Ethical Reality Climax. I'd explain the rules, but I'm gonna let Rob Van Dam do it. Time to see how the game is played. Fight your way through Professor Genki's Super Sparkle Lab for fun and profit. Now, with every man, woman, and tiger shot, your prize money goes up. But look out, no one likes it when you shoot a panel. On it, unethical. Once you've collected enough money, the door to the lab opens up and you're free to go. But if you think it's that easy, you've never seen Kinky before. Oh, and one more thing. On this show, no one gets to take a break. If you want to stay in the fight, be sure to shoot the first aid target. Good luck. It's murder time. Fun time. Basically, this is a timed gauntlet where you've got to shoot your way through the level and build up enough cash to be able to leave. Since your health doesn't regenerate during this activity, you've got to move quickly and carefully and not get bogged down in gunfights. What's also neat about Professor Genki is that the levels are pretty well designed. Each encounter keeps you on your toes, trying to reach the threshold whilst also making sure you leave each gunfight with as little damage as possible. Methodically taking down enemies won't get you very far, so you've just got to bite the bullet and throw yourself into the fray. You've also got to be careful about navigating each course since they're all littered with traps that'll drain your health and leave you open to attack. Just like Mayhem, there's a combo meter too, and it functions the same way except the meter increases for various actions. Stuff like scoring headshots, chaining together kills, and evading traps. This next activity, I... I don't even know, man. This one's called Tiger Escort, and you've gotta drive around an angry tiger until your courage meter is filled. The thing is that the tiger will randomly attack you, and you'll lose control of the car briefly. Not helping is that you're being chased around by animal rights activists who are driving in these vans, and they'll either try to run you off the road, or force you into a collision. The best way to beat this activity is to just keep the pedal to the metal, and don't stop for anything. Returning activities are pretty much the other ones seen in previous Saints Row games. Okay, so I couldn't find a good place in the script for this rant, but here goes. With the missions in this game being fun, having good presentation, or just being well designed, I struggle to understand why the devs took out the ability to replay story missions and rewatch cutscenes. There's legitimately no benefit to doing this, especially since the first two games allowed that. What could have been done instead would be adding challenges or a scoring system to missions that you're replaying. Players would definitely get more out of the game after beating it. Hell, throw some trophies or achievements into the mix too. There was also no reason for them to remove the ability to replay cutscenes too. Now, that's just ridiculous. 
More ridiculous is the fact that in subsequent re-releases, especially the remaster, you still can't replay anything. I apologize for the sudden rant about replayability, it's just that it was difficult trying to find an appropriate place for it in the script. With Saints Row the Third having a completely linear story structure, I'll be going over each crew at the beginning and end of their respective arcs. Now that the Saints have established a foothold in Steelport, it's time to bring the fight to the Syndicate. Boss and Pierce meet up at a bar and start discussing their next move. The raid on the penthouse was nice and all, but what Boss really wants is to see Loren dead. Pierce believes that he's hiding out in Syndicate Tower downtown, but Boss thinks that Loren's smarter than that. One lead they do have is a designer gun store in town called Powder. Pierce saw some of Loren's goons speaking to the owner, so there's gotta be something they can get from there. During the drive to the spot, Boss gets Shondi on the phone and tells her to meet them there. The trio makes it to the store and briefly deliberates on how to get inside, but Shondi has a simple solution. What about the inside, motherfucker? Put in your tampons and let's do this. Unfortunately, Shondi underestimated how many people would be guarding the back alley leading to the warehouse, because these guys have this place more guarded than the Pentagon itself. Then again, this isn't really much of a challenge for these guys. After all, if they can do a raid on an entire penthouse, they can definitely handle a shootout like this. Once inside the warehouse, we're greeted by not only foot soldiers, but snipers as well. It's best to get rid of the snipers as soon as you can, because they'll just be a nuisance as you try to navigate the place. After blazing through the Morningstar before us, we have to fight a minigun brute. Remember what I said about these guys being particularly dangerous and annoying to fight in tight spaces? Yeah, this dude's gonna give you hell if you come to this fight without the proper health and damage upgrades. The brute gets taken down, and a bunch of Morningstar rush towards their deaths. We make our way upstairs, gun down some more enemies, and we finally reach the manager's office. The guy must have dipped some time ago, so Shondi decides that she's gonna steal some info off of his computer. This places us into one of those sections in games where we've gotta fend off a bunch of enemies until the bar reaches the end. Shondi gets what she needs off the computer, and we're good to go. The mission ends, and guess what? Powder's not a store you can buy anything from. Would've been nice for it to be a gun store where you can buy more expensive and top-of-the-line weapons whilst also being able to customize their skins. Thankfully, weapon skins would become a thing in Saints Row 4. The day finally arrives. Boss feels like they've waited long enough and tells Pierce that it's time to go after Loren. The plan's pretty simple. Go to Syndicate Tower, kill our way through, and assassinate the man himself. Boss gets Shondi on the phone and tells her that it's time to make a move on Loren and to meet them at the penthouse. Preparations are made, and it's finally time to go after the Syndicate chairman. We're also treated to a slow motion shot of the trio walking towards the camera, and there's no denying that that's badass in its own right. On the way to Syndicate Tower, Boss asks Shondi if she's sure that she wants to go through with this, and she's 110% on board. She wants to make sure that Loren gets what's coming to him for killing Johnny. Once again, still concerning that Pierce shows little emotion about losing Gat, remember that bomb we stole from the National Guard when we arrived in Steelport? The other Saints are going to be driving it into the loading dock so that we can use it on the tower. We make it to the parking garage, and as expected, the Morningstar are there on high alert. After clearing out the enemies, Boss decides to stupidly arm the bomb before entering the tower, putting us on a 16 minute time limit. Bomb setting the clock's ticking. Why didn't we wait to do that until after we kill Loren? That's a really good question. We should move. The time limit's nothing to worry about, to be honest. It's actually a pretty generous time limit, the more I think about it. All you have to do is just not get bogged down in gunfights and keep it moving. Loren stops the elevator we're in on a random floor, knowing that the Saints would try something like this. This floor turns out to be a cloning facility where all the brutes we've been fighting are made. I love how this game goes from a zany action comedy to Metal Gear Rising for like one level. 
After we kill everyone in the lab, the trio makes their way to a room where a very large man is being strung up by his limbs. His name is Oleg Kirilov, and the reason the Syndicate is keeping him here is because they're using his DNA to make clones that possess his strength, but not his intellect. Oleg's on board with killing Philippe, not that it took much convincing, and the trio sets him free by shooting his restraints. The guy doesn't want to talk about his past and tells us that as long as we're an enemy of the Syndicate, we shouldn't have anything to worry about from him. We finally have Loren in our sight, but he escapes via an express elevator that leads to a basement. Getting desperate, Boss jumps onto some ceiling thing? I don't even know what to call that. Anyways, Boss latches onto it and asks Oleg to knock it loose so that it'll crush Loren. I don't even know how Boss knows the exact spot that it's gonna land at. While Oleg is busy detaching the ceiling thing, we've gotta hold our own for a little bit. The ceiling thing comes loose and falls down several stories. On the way down, a brute latches on, but he's quickly swatted away. Okay, so the next scene is really weird because of the strange way it's edited. You see the problem? Back when I first played this, I thought that Philippe survived and was standing somewhere else away from where the metal sphere hit the ground. This is all thanks to that sudden cutaway from Loren and the lack of blood at where he was standing. I didn't even find out until hours after playing this mission that Loren got crushed to death. I'm gonna put Loren's death on the back burner for a second because we still have a bomb to deal with. After making it to the parking garage, the player is presented with a choice blow up Syndicate Tower and earn a permanent respect bonus, or keep Syndicate Tower for yourselves and earn a permanent cash bonus. On all my replays of Saints Row the Third, I always go with the option to keep the tower. The reason why is because, well, I never really cared about earning respect in this game, and it's always nice to have some extra cash in my pocket too. Another reason I chose to keep the tower is because it feels like something the Saints would do had there not been a choice given to the player in the first place. I have some unfortunate news though. Even if you don't destroy the tower, this place is never made into a crib, which makes no sense at all. It's really strange that this place isn't a crib, especially after what we did at the penthouse. They're fine with us taking over the penthouse, but the lines drawn at Syndicate Tower, former headquarters of Philippe Loren himself? This mission and the ones leading up to it also demonstrate that the pacing of this game's story is too out of control for its own good. To reiterate, the Saints arrive on enemy turf and on that same night, they attack a military base and steal a bomb that was going to be used for god knows what. Then in less than a few hours of playtime, the Saints have already raided and taken over both the Syndicate penthouse and Loren's tower. That brings me to Philippe Loren himself. What a tragic waste of a villain. In the marketing, and even in the game itself, at least the early parts, Loren is presented as this big bad kingpin who has control over every nook and cranny of Steelport. In an April 2011 issue of Game Informer magazine, the marketing team or whoever hypes the absolute hell out of Loren. I even made fun of this on my community tab too. In the end, what did all this hype amount to? Loren getting catamaried in less than a few hours of playtime. After the attack on Syndicate Tower, we're brought back to Stillwater, where Monica Hughes, widow of the late Richard Hughes from Saints Row 1, is opening up a memorial bridge built in his name. The Saints are also on this bridge, with Gat's body in a hearse, presumably so that they can bring him back to Stillwater and bury him. Unfortunately, this celebration is cut short when the Luchadors launch a surprise attack on the Saints. The Luchadors give chase, not letting up, and causing one of the Saints' vehicles to be thrown into the waters below. The camera then pans in on Kilbane, with him and his men firing rockets at the Saints, but the volley is somewhat unsuccessful. Kilbane fires the last rocket, scoring a good shot on the hearse and knocking it off the bridge. Surviving the ambush, the main cast realizes the kind of danger they're in, especially since Kilbane doesn't seem like the type to shy away from assaulting a funeral procession. Oleg knows some people who hate the Syndicate as much as we do, and he knows where to find them. 
Back on shore, Monica Hughes is understandably pissed, and she's heading back to Capitol Hill to discuss the bridge incident with the federal government. Returning to Steelport, the trio are getting ready to rescue one of Oleg's associates. The first one is a woman named Kinsey Kensington. Kinsey is an ex-FBI agent, and that rightfully sets off red flags with everyone. But Pierce tells us that she was fired most likely because she had some potentially damaging info on the syndicate, leading to the Deckers setting her up for termination. Right now, the Deckers are holding her captive on a barge in the middle of the river, and we've gotta go rescue her. We make it to the barge, kill our way through, and we find Kinsey tied up. She doesn't seem excited about being rescued, but that's because she's waiting to see if we were sent here to kill her. Once Kinsey's untied, she gives us some info on the DeWinter sisters. The DeWinter sisters are keeping a rival pimp named Zemos captive at their BDSM club, SafeWord. They locked him up because they were facing some fierce competition from him when it came to prostitution in Steelport. Shawnee's gonna take Kinsey back to town while Pierce and Boss break into Safe Word and rescue Zemos. Kinsey gets on the phone and thanks us for rescuing her and reveals that she has info on a third person that we can recruit, she just doesn't have their location yet. The duo arrives at the club and let me just say that it's about to get really weird from this point on. You've been warned. When Boss starts shaking down one of the patrons for info on Zemos, he gives us the info alright and he wants us to hit him. No, 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 I'm not about to take part. I'm not even kink shaming either because, dude, that lady's in the room with you for a very good reason. Go ask her for that. So we go and shake down some more misguidedly horny patrons until we find out the location of the manager's room. The manager's found, shaken down, and we find out where they're keeping Zemos. We find Zemos being kept in a basement tied to a... <sighs> tied to a pony cart. There's more reinforcements headed our way, so we hop on and get out of there. The Morningstar is also chasing after us on pony carts too, and guess what? These niggas explode if you shoot them long enough. I'm not kidding. The chase is over, and Zemos is finally a free man. Thanks to his smoking habit taking a toll on his throat, he has to speak through an electro larynx. Except Zemos... This is a rescue, right? <laughs> this ain't some elaborate setup for a gangbang. Why you gotta put that image in my head, bro? Yeah, he took a few too many pages from T-Pain's notebook. We get a phone call from Kinsey, who has info on the third contact. His name is Angel de la Muerte, and he was Kilbane's tag team partner in the ring until they had a falling out. Because of this, Angel's been holding on to a years old grudge against Kilbane and is more than willing to help us if it means he gets to settle the score with him. Right now, Angel is at his gym, but he's being attacked by a squad of luchadors. Oh yeah, and Zemos is tagging along too. We make it to the gym, and these dudes are carrying out a full-on assault just to get to one guy. You'd think that Angel was John Wick with the way they're gunning for him. Halfway through clearing out the block, Oleg joins the fight. After wiping out the first hit squad, the trio meets up with Angel inside the gym, but there's little time to chat, as there are more luchadors outside. Oleg actually saves us a headache by taking on one of the brutes himself while we deal with the rest of the cannon fodder. What's really neat about Oleg is that he goes out of his way to engage brutes on his own, leaving you an opportunity to lay down some firepower on them. Not only that, but sometimes he'll pick up weapons dropped by other brutes such as the minigun or the flamethrower. He's definitely one of the best homies to have by your side in gunfights like these. Three brutes and dozens of luchadors later, the gym is finally safe. At a random meeting spot, Kilbane has gathered the DeWinter sisters and Matt and poses a question to them. Who will lead the syndicate now that Loren is dead? Matt suggests that leadership be transferred to the DeWinters only to eat a nasty chair shot courtesy of Kilbane. At this point, Kilbane has pretty much strong-armed his way into leading the syndicate. Back at Saints HQ, Boss is introducing the three new lieutenants, but not without dropping the iconic line. Talk to one of these guys, they'll have things for you to do. It's our time now. Let's get this shit started. So the next series of missions from the new lieutenants is pretty much just them introducing us to past activities, each with their own little storyline. For Angel, he wants us to be prepared physically and mentally for a battle with the luchadors. So how does he go about training us? By having us throw ourselves into oncoming traffic, putting on a fire suit and riding around an ATV while we're on fire, and driving a convertible with an angry tiger in the passenger seat. You know, Angel, we could have done something a lot more practical, like, I don't know, crippling something the luchadors has stakes in. What's with this Sergeant Hartman-ass training? 
Jokes aside, a series of unique missions from Angel involving Boss doing some weird or intense training under his watchful eye would have made for a pretty heartwarming and charming bit of story. Imagine hearing Angel reminisce about his glory days with Kilbane while he has you walking barefoot across some burning charcoal whilst trying to do some target practice. This was the perfect opportunity to have some unique mission design alongside some exposition, but instead, it's another excuse to reintroduce activities from the last game. A fucking tiger? If you're fighting the luchadors, you need to be ready for anything. A fucking tiger? Don't lose the message in the method. You mastered your fear. Up next is Kinsey. Her series of activities starts off with us helping her move into her new place. We're then told that she can't help us until she tracks down where some of the Deckers are at. I mean, outside of Shondi's ex's place would be a good start. Anyways, this introduces us to a new activity, one that I forgot to mention in the prologue. This one's called Trailblazing. Trailblazing is pretty much an obstacle course where you ride around in cyberspace in a race against time. It's pretty simple when it comes down to it. I also love how the design team decided to do a throwback to Tron with the aesthetics on display here. Just like Angel, the next few missions is just Kinsey introducing missions from the past game, except for Guardian Angel. With all of that done, we've created enough chaos around the Decker's neck of the woods to be able to take on Matt Miller. One way I'd improve Kinsey's introductory missions would be to have at least half of them be stealth oriented. Not on the same level as Metal Gear Solid or Dishonored, but something a little basic. That would have been fitting given Kinsey's background as an FBI agent and her computer expertise. Remember, throw out your phone! And finally, we go and do some work for Zemos. We're pretty much just going around and putting the screws to the Morningstar. The game once again gets us reacquainted with past activities, and we're ready to take on what's left of Loren's crew. I'm out of ideas for this one. I can't even begin to think of ways to improve Zemos' intro missions. You killed Philippe Loren and showed the Morningstar that you are here to stay. Time to relax and cut loose, baby. Some time later, Shondi gets on the phone and she's furious. Pierce decided to throw a spur of the moment party when really we should be focusing on taking down the syndicate. Boss takes a trip to Saints HQ to handle the situation because Pierce is at the top of Shondi's shit list right now. We walk in to ask Pierce about why he's suddenly throwing parties at a time like this. Zemos also needs to work on his conflict resolution skills. I was saddled up in a human pony show. Will you see me crying about a little girl? I swear to God, I will shove that thing down your throat hole. Pierce believes that it's time to move on, and that the gang can't mourn Gat forever. I know I've been beating this point to death, but refer back to the Ronin storyline. It's crazy, because Boss showed more concern about nearly losing Gat when he got stabbed by Junichi than he does when Gat dies and even in the aftermath of it all. Pierce kind of has a point. We can't mourn Gat forever, it's just that his timing with all of this is so poor. So Shondi storms off, leaving in a terrible mood. Later on, Boss and Pierce are receiving lap dances, but these dancers have more than that in mind. Indeed, these hoes ain't hoes. As you may have guessed by now, these strippers were sent to infiltrate Saints HQ undercover by the Syndicate. The Saints took over one of your properties and the best you can come at them with is stripper assassins? It's not a totally horrible plan though. It does beg the question as to how the Saints didn't bother screening any of these chicks before letting them into HQ like that. Looks like the Saints fell for the classic Trojan horse strategy. Also, this just randomly came to me, but has anybody else noticed that Troy, the undercover cop, was named after the city that was invaded using that same tactic. I love subtle things like that. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. In the middle of the assault, the power gets cut, and on top of that, we've gotta get to the roof and take care of some snipers on the other buildings. You gotta be careful when taking cover on the rooftop, because you're actually sitting next to power boxes that will explode and leave you stunned when shot. Once all the snipers are gone, we go and restore power to the place. Operating on the same speed as Internet Explorer, Oleg gives us a call and tells us to cancel the party because it's a trap. 
I don't know how much of the plan Oleg heard about, but he reveals that the Morningstar was supposed to bring in some attack choppers along with the undercover strippers. The helicopters are all wiped out, and the attack on the Saints is brought to an end. Elsewhere in Steelport, Kilbane isn't too happy about the botched attempt on the Saints' lives. Even Matt agrees that the plan was awful. Then Kilbane snaps. Literally. How about you, Eddie? There's a reason Philippe left the thinking to us. <sighs> We're done here. <laughs> Kilbane! Relax, we only need one of them. Kilbane crouches down and reminds Viola that she's got time to correct her mistakes or she'll face the same fate as her sister. And then he pisses on Kiki's memory by offering Viola tickets to his next wrestling match as restitution. One thing I wish is that the antagonists of this game had more cutscenes of them interacting with each other. Their scenes together are absurdly short, and we don't get to see much of the dynamics between them. The De Winter sisters don't get much dialogue, Kilbane is just there until he's made into an antagonist, and Matt and Philippe are the only ones contributing to whatever conversations these guys have when they're all in the same room, and that's few and far between. Antagonists in the previous Saints Row games had extensive cutscenes with each other, whether it be them trying to figure out how to tackle the Saints, or a power struggle occurring between a leader and their lieutenant. With the main players in the Syndicate barely being fleshed out, you're left with a group of bad guys working together because, well, the Saints needed someone to fight that week. I wish we got to see their personalities and ideals clash and come together more often. That's why I love storylines like the Vice Kings, because you personally get to see how a power struggle between the major players will end, to the point where you almost want to empathize with Ben King, and that's before he gets betrayed. I think that Loren should have died somewhere in the middle of the story, and not the beginning so that we can see more of him, how he runs the Syndicate, and how his interactions with other members play out. The decision to kill Johnny so early makes me wonder how much of this game's story was written by THQ, and not Volition. Saints Row the Third has this horrible habit of introducing something, but doing nothing or very little with it. Loren is introduced and killed in a shockingly short amount of time. The Syndicate is in shambles in the wake of of Loren's death, but we don't see much of that outside of the remaining leaders debating on what to do and Viola getting her neck broke by Kilbane. Boss gives Zemos a call, and Zemos says that he's got a good plan for getting back at the Morningstar. He wants to meet up with us to fill us in on the details, though. We find Zemos watching a jumbo vision, and on the screen is Monica Hughes speaking at Capitol Hill. She says that in spite of no one taking credit for the attack on the bridge, Monica believes that the root cause of stuff like this is the glorification of gangs in pop culture and media. Because of the bridge attack and rampant gang violence, the United States Senate launches the STAG initiative. This is gonna come back a bit later. Okay, so before I continue, this mission's gonna get real weird, so just bear with me once again. Zemos has a lead that'll really hurt the Morningstar. He hands us an invitation to one of their clubs that's auctioning prostitutes. If we show them that card, we're in. The thing is, we're not going undercover as an auctioneer. Against our will, Zemos is auctioning us off so that we can act as a Trojan horse and disrupt their operation from within. So we're drugged, stripped naked, and thrown into the club. Zemos hands us our guns back, and I don't think I want to know where those mags are stored. First thing we do when we make it inside is kill the guards at the front desk and attempt to disable the alarm. Unfortunately, we've got to go farther inside to get to the security system. Just like that one Sons of Somdi mission, we're high as hell and aiming is going to be a bit of a challenge. After blasting through some of these guys, we find ourselves in the basement. Zemos decides to free the imprisoned sex workers, and they proceed to assist us in fucking up any and all Morningstar they come across. I'm all for you guys helping out, but I'd appreciate it if you didn't get in my line of fire. Security gets disabled, and the rest of the prostitutes are freed. The brute that they send in, I kinda feel bad for, because this dude got outgunned by some naked guy. Once this mission is over, we now have safe word as another crib. Too bad you can't explore the rest of it, and you're confined to only navigating the penthouse portion. Sometime later, Boss gets Zemos on the phone and asks for more ways they can hit the Morningstar. Zemos is sapped of ideas until Boss gets an unexpected call from Viola de Winter. She tells us that there's a container full of women being brought into Steelport by ship to replace the ones lost during the failed attack on Saints HQ. When asked to identify herself, Viola states her name and which organization she's with. Looks like we've got a new lead, so Boss tells Zemos to get Pierce and meet up at the docks. We have a boat to catch. 
over at the docks, the two are able to confirm that the lead they were given is valid. All we need to do now is head over there and free the girls. If we pull this off, the Morningstar's sex operations in Steelport will be finished. Once we make it to the ship, our objective now is to go to each shipping crate and free anyone trapped inside. The thing is that you've got to play a guessing game and find out which crate contains the prostitutes and which ones are there just to waste your time. Oh yeah, and some of these containers have brutes in them. Thanks, Morningstar. After freeing all the prostitutes, we've got to clear the area so that Pierce can safely land and move these crates back to shore. This is pretty much a repeat of that penultimate Brotherhood mission, except it's less drawn out and less of a headache. Once we're done thwarting the Morningstar's maritime assault, Pierce is able to fly near the ship and grab the crate containing the prostitutes, and we're off. While flying back to Steelport, we've got to keep Pierce's helicopter safe by using the Annihilator RPG. This thing's real fun to use because not only does it lock onto targets for better accuracy, but it's remote controlled, meaning that each rocket will fly towards wherever you rotate the stick until the moment of impact. Think of it like the Destructo Disc from Dragon Ball. This mission is also the best place to clear the boat's destroyed challenge in the challenge list if you're looking to shoot for the Platinum. It's also a good spot to fill out some of the quota for multi-kill. The rest of this mission is pretty much just Guardian Angel. During the flight home, Matt Miller calls Boss's phone and he wants to make a deal with us. If we bring the prostitutes that we rescued back to him, he'll pay us top dollar per person. He hangs up and Boss lets Zemos know about the phone call. Zemos suggests that we bring the prostitutes back to his place instead. So in gameplay terms, if we bring them back to Matt, we'll get a huge payout from him instantly. If we bring them to Zemos, we'll get increased hourly income. Okay, so this is really stupid. At the start of the game, the Syndicate extorted the hell out of the Saints, and they also killed Gat. So why in the world would Boss of all people even entertain the idea of accepting a deal with one of the heads of the Syndicate? When it comes to storytelling, it's completely normal for characters to make dumb decisions. A character doing something stupid is not a sign of bad writing. A character doing something that's completely out of character without any kind of rhyme or reason is where things start to get iffy. Boss is known for being fiercely loyal to the Saints since the beginning of the series. Outside of getting a huge amount of cash, what does Boss gain from accepting a deal with the very same people whom have been trying their best to kill him and his crew from the start? Not too long ago, these dudes sent a bunch of undercover strippers to kill you at your own headquarters. Not only that, but accepting this deal is a huge middle finger to Zemos in everything he stands for. The world of prostitution is known for coming with a lot of danger from abusive pimps and clients, but Zemos sees this and wants to make a change by treating any worker he gets fairly. He clearly has a lot of passion for keeping these workers safe while still turning a profit at the end of the day. My point is that this decision sucks and it never should have made its way into the story. Just bring the women to Zemos because it makes more sense in the grand scheme of things. Also, imagine Shandi's reaction to hearing about Boss doing business with the Syndicate. At that point, I totally wouldn't blame her for cutting ties with the crew. Over at Kilbane's casino, Kilbane is really pissed at Matt for even thinking about brokering a deal with the Saints. He makes it clear that he's the one who calls the shot, not Matt. Kilbane suddenly has an idea, and he lays it out to Matt off-screen. Meanwhile in Washington, Monica Hughes announces that Stag has been deployed to Steelport, and going by the text at the bottom, the city is going to be under martial law. Things are about to get a whole lot interesting. Boss gives Oleg a call, and the two start wondering if Viola can be trusted in spite of her turning against the Syndicate. Sure, she helped us out with dissolving the Morningstar, but what's her endgame? Viola calls and says that she wants to meet with Boss, so we set up a meeting at a park in Ashwood. When the three of them show up at the meet spot, tensions are understandably high. Why should we trust Viola of all people when she and her organization have been trying to kill us from the start? The reason she's turning her back on the Syndicate is because she wants Kilbane to pay for murdering her sister. 
They put aside their differences, and Viola is now with the Saints. The meeting gets cut short when a bunch of armored trucks come rushing into the park with the Saints dead in their sights. It's Stag. The trio decides to flee with Stag in heavy pursuit. We retreat inside a building, while behind us, a woman named Kia guiding the squad gives her commander a sit rep. Inside the building, the Saints start wondering about who these guys are and why they're gunning after them like this. We make it to a strip club and Stag begins their assault. Stag is on a whole different level though because they're using laser weapons. This is where the game falls apart for a lot of fans, and rightfully so. As if all the things we've seen and done so far wasn't crazy enough, there's futuristic weaponry added to the equation. I think that players would take Stag more seriously if they were just a bunch of guys with regular military equipment but with similar tactics and aggression. I mean, sure, we had the Masako coming after us like this in Saints Row 2, but they never had this kind of hardware. As for the laser weapons themselves, they're terrible. Just stick to using regular guns. All of the laser weapons don't reload. Instead, you fire them until they overheat and have to wait for them to cool off. On top of that, the laser weapons themselves lack any kind of weight or impact when they land a shot on the enemy. Their sound design is weak, and the appearance of the lasers don't pack a punch. The firing rate on these weapons is poor too. You'd be better off using a level 1 45 Shepard than any of the laser guns. Anyways, we survive the initial assault inside the strip club and make our way upstairs to the roof. These guys are not fucking around. They've got high-speed VTOLs and an entire aircraft carrier at their disposal. While on the roof, we have to hold our own against Stag while we wait for Viola to fix the elevator. Stag will occasionally drop off soldiers on the rooftop from one of their VTOLs. Enemies will also appear on other buildings too, so make sure you've got a sniper by your side. Eventually, they'll send in some VTOLs to get up close and personal, so you've got to deal with bringing those down while being shot at. The VTOLs themselves don't fire single round shots, but instead they fire a continuous laser beam that can drain your health the longer it stays on you. Not helping is that some of the enemies flying the VTOLs will have insanely good tracking and won't keep the laser off of you no matter how fast you run or how many times you dive roll. Oleg decides that he's going to create a distraction for one of the VTOLs and hops on the nose and gives it some work. Also, during this take, I failed the mission because Oleg died after jumping onto the jet because the game forgot to flag the jet itself as indestructible. Whoops. Viola finally gets the elevator working, and we can head downstairs. The two fight their way through the club again, and they jump inside a police car that's just conveniently sitting near the front doors. The chase is on, and Stag won't allow themselves to let up. Remember those armored trucks from the opening cutscene of this mission? They're equipped with turrets that can fire lasers and hit harder. It's best to put a lot of distance between you and the trucks, and don't try to fight these guys off either. Just haul ass. During the chase, Boss and Viola start speculating on who Stag is and why they're gunning for them on a scale like this. They may not know it, but these guys are funded by none other than the federal government. Shondi phones us and says that Stag is all over the city and they're going after anyone and everyone who's in a gang. Right now, Shondi and crew are running for cover. Viola and Boss make it back to HQ safely and all is good. For now. Aboard the Stag aircraft carrier, the Thermopylae, Commander Cyrus Temple is holding a Q&A about the STAG initiative at a press conference. For starters, STAG stands for Special Tactical Anti-Gang. Cyrus himself confirms that Steelport is being indefinitely occupied by these guys with the full support of Mayor Reynolds. When asked about how STAG will impact the daily lives of Steelport citizens, Cyrus goes and tells a story about Jessica, you know, the chick from the last game we tricked Marrow into killing. He recaps her life story and says that if that were our daughter, how far would everyone want for Stag to go? He pretty much just dodged the question. Hey Commander Temple, how will Stag impact our daily lives? Daily lives? You want to hear a story about some chick who got crushed by a monster truck? Looks like Cyrus Temple took notes from Dane Vogel in the art of dodging questions. So Stag is now occupying Steelport, which is going to have an effect on the open world. For starters, later on in the Stag arc, if you go to downtown, you automatically get level 1 notoriety from the police. The thing is that this happens even if you decide to reload a save and spawn at Saints HQ. Secondly, depending on where you're at in the city, Stag will come after you at level 1 police notoriety, which means that you've got to put up with getting pelted by laser rounds even at the lowest level. I like 
that Stag's presence could be seen and felt throughout Steelport. You can really feel these guys putting the screws to not just the Saints, but the other gangs in the city. I wish they took this a bit further by closing down some of the Planet Saints stores around Steelport and forcing the player to unlock them by doing a side mission or attacking a stag base. Maybe even reward the player with unique clothing or discounts for reopening the store. This sounds like a good idea, until you realize that that would mean dipping our toes into Ubisoft territory. Despite that, it's not a totally horrible idea. I also wish we could see some unique interactions between Stag and the other pedestrians. Have them doing stuff like hassling civilians or gang members, making them get on the ground, or having them face a wall while they do something else before taking them in. Stag as an enemy faction has somewhat won me over, it's just that I think they should have regular military hardware instead of all these futuristic weapons and stuff. The inclusion of future tech is arguably Saints Row 3's greatest weakness. The weapons themselves are the straw that broke the camel's back in completely destroying the game's tone and atmosphere. Up until now, we the player have seen stuff like buff giants with the strength to lift cars and cloning facilities. Before we're introduced to Stag, the game was already pushing it with some of the wild things you'd see and come across. Even with everything I previously mentioned in mind, the introduction of future technology in this game isn't good because they're thrown in haphazardly with little preparation given to fans of the past games. Now I get that the writers of this game wanted Saints Row to stand out in the overcrowded open world genre, but this is just too much. You could give Stag regular military equipment and almost nothing would change. The first mission with Stag is where a lot of fans would roll their eyes in annoyance and reluctantly press on or drop the game completely. The cloning facility was already enough. The future guns is too much. Volition had a chance to course correct all this in Saints Row 4, but without saying too much, that game is pretty much the point of no return for them and this franchise as a whole. Sometime later, Boss gives Pierce a phone call and warns that Saints HQ might be compromised. Pierce doesn't sound too concerned, so Boss decides to drive over and get things under control. At HQ, Boss tells Pierce and Oleg that it's time to pack our things and move out. Not before fucking up this high-stakes game of chess, though. Pack it up, we gotta move. I got 20k on this game! <laughs> Damn! Now it's a draw. While Pierce and crew are loading the trucks, Boss is going to create a distraction for Stag so that they've got time to move their stuff around. After running through a Stag outpost, Boss hijacks a VTOL and kicks off the plan. I'm a big fan of flying VTOLs in this game. These things possess two modes of flight, hover mode and jet mode. Hover mode allows you to slowly move around in the air, and this is good for when you need to take proper aim at a target. Jet mode is pretty self-explanatory. You zoom around at hundreds of kilometers per hour. The weapons that VTOLs come equipped with are rockets and that laser beam from earlier. The rockets are just that, rockets. You can also hold down the fire button to adjust how much power you want behind that shot. There's also a lock-on system at play here too, functioning the same as the lock-on from the Annihilator RPG. Now that we have a VTOL, the game needs us to seek out several stag outposts and destroy them while Pierce and the convoy gets moving. In the middle of our reign of terror, Pierce tells us that the convoy ran into a stag roadblock and he needs us to fly over there to clear it out. The roadblock is destroyed, and Boss continues flying around Steelport and making life a living hell for these guys. Radio chatter from the flight computer suggests that they're scrambling around trying to find out who's piloting the rogue VTOL. There's a wonderful sense of schadenfreude just from listening to these guys sweat. I also love Boss's attitude during this mission because he's taking a lot of joy from picking a fight with Stag. Boss loves a good fight, especially from enemies bigger than the police and the gangs themselves. In the last game, when Masako Hit Squad started seeking out and trying to kill the Saints, Boss took this as a challenge, and he used the conflict with Ultor as a chance to have some fun while crippling them at the same time. He does this by making it expensive for Ultor to come after them, and eventually destroying and exposing Ultor's secret R&D facility. Let it be known that if you're some kind of paramilitary or mercenary faction that wants to clash with the Saints, you'd better be prepared for a war like no other. Boss is not the type to go down without a good fight. So during the course of this mission, make sure to stay high in the air and minimize any damage the VTOL takes. Enemies on the ground will be coming after you with tanks and truck turrets. If you have to lose your aircraft, make sure you're near one that's grounded. If you lose your VTOL and there are none around, you're better off restarting from your last checkpoint because the streets are too hot. 
You also want to take out other VTOLs that get in your way as quickly as possible since those guys have the best odds of making you crash. Oleg eventually contacts us requesting backup. Alright, so let's give Oleg some props for going toe to toe with Stag like that. Dude is tough as hell for being able to hold his own against them for that long. We make it to the bridge where Oleg is being attacked and lay down some cover fire for the Russian menace. Pierce delivers another sit rep and says that the convoy can't go speeding through the streets out of fear of drawing attention. Boss thinks that he might be able to take the heat off of them if he goes and destroys a surveillance aircraft flying over Steelport. So we speed over to the aircraft, fend off a few of Stag's finest, and bring the plane down. Pierce tells us that the move is done and all is good. Remember Josh Burke? You know, the dude who single-handedly ruined the bank heist at the start of the game? Well, Stag has him recruited to be their spokesperson. The commercial they have him starring in is a recruitment campaign for Stag. I'm Joshua Burke. Hey. On TV, I play Nightblade, an exceptionally good-looking but misunderstood vampire who risks life and limb every week to keep the world safe. The men and women of Stag put their lives on the line every day to protect your city against gang violence. Want to be a real-world hero? Talk to your Stag recruiter today. I know I have. At a conference room, Cyrus and Kia are on the phone with Senator Monica Hughes, and they're not huge fans of the ad campaign. Monica says that this is a hearts and minds strategy, but Cyrus wants her to authorize something called the Daedalus. Monica refuses and tasks them with ensuring the safety of Josh. The whole plot point about the Saints being forced out of their own headquarters out of fear from Stag feels pretty pointless once you realize that you can continue using that crib like normal. I think this crib should have been locked, and the Saints should have been given a new crib somewhere else outside of downtown after this mission. I get that players love the downtown crib, and as a developer, you don't want to rip something like that away. But if you want to sell the idea that the Saints fear for their safety, then make Saints HQ inaccessible for the time being. Letting the player freely access this crib after the fact takes the wind out of everything we did just now and makes this mission as a whole feel pointless. Boss contacts Kinsey asking if she's got any info on the Deckers, which she does. However, Kinsey doesn't want to make a move against the Deckers yet, and instead she tells us to bring Shondi so that we can meet her at a diner. At the diner, Kinsey shows us something on her laptop and it's not good. Matt Miller doctored footage of them celebrating the destruction of the Hughes Memorial Bridge. In the newsroom with Jane Valderrama is Kilbane himself. He's doing an interview smearing the image of the saint in an attempt to take the heat off the syndicate by claiming he's a legitimate businessman. The broadcast location is undisclosed and Kinsey sends us out to track it down. We're put on a 16 minute time limit and the game needs us to get to a nearby helicopter. While we're flying, we get to listen to the interview with Kilbane. It starts off with Kilbane explaining the reason behind his other nickname, The Walking Apocalypse. He says that the name isn't intended to frighten, but instead to inspire fans to rise above the existence of being a regular man. Uh, sure, let's go with that, I guess. And then he trashes the saints by saying that they prey on the weak and see every person as a paycheck. Yeah, real rich coming from Kilbane of all people. Before the interview cuts to commercial, Kilbane also mentions that he's opened up programs for children as well. Kinsey sends us the coordinates of several radio towers throughout Steelport, and she needs us to contact her once we reach one of them. The interview continues, and Jane moves on to the subject of Kilbane's summer wrestling program called Kilbane's Crunch Camp. It's a wrestling camp for children that Kilbane created to get them off the streets. Then he uses this as an opportunity to once again smear the reputation of the Third Street Saints. It's a two-month summer program that gets kids off the streets and into the ring. There's been some concern from parent groups. Well, that's because parents are putties. Maybe they should focus on a real threat like the Third Street Saints. We make it to the first radio tower, and there's a squad of Deckers waiting there for us. Kinsey believes that they're also using this tower for their Usenet, which is gonna be important later. What she needs us to do is to plant a transmitter on that tower. So we clear out the enemies, set up the transmitter, and jump back in the helicopter. The interview with Kilbane goes on. Jane brings up Kilbane's former tag team partner, Angel de la Muerte. Kilbane plays this off by downplaying the intensity of their beef by saying that Angel lost and he won. Nothing more, nothing less. When asked if he'd be up for a rematch with Angel, Kilbane responds with disgust saying that a rematch with Angel would be an admission that he's worthy of his time. Ouch. Gotta give Kilbane some credit for being skilled in the art of disrespect. 
Speaking of disrespect, I forgot to mention the level of audacity that Kilbane has. This nigga and his crew followed the Saints for presumably miles on end to Stillwater just so Kilbane could assault the Saints' funeral procession. That is some next level hating. This also marks the second time that Johnny Gat has been attacked at a funeral. Shogo may have attacked the Saints during a burial, but Kilbane manages to one-up him and attacks a fucking funeral procession. The duo arrives at the second tower, and we've got some enemies to tackle. Shondi wonders how the Saints are gonna handle such a smear campaign, since everyone thinks that they blew up a bridge. Boss thinks that the Saints' PR department can handle this, but something of this magnitude? That's gonna be an uphill battle. I mean, if Saints Row 3 took place in today's world, the PR department would just type out some heartfelt statement that vaguely addresses the incident at the bridge. Also, Monica was standing just meters away from the funeral procession, so why doesn't she rule out the possibility of the Saints launching the attack? Not only that, but there were two differently colored vehicles from both gangs trading gunfire on the bridge, so the people tending to the crime scene should have done a more thorough investigation. Anyways, the transmitter is planted, and Kinsey gives us another phone call. She says that there's a van driving around town helping to mask the broadcast signal, and she needs us to shine a laser on it. Meanwhile, during the interview, Jane asks about accusations calling Murder Brawl 31, an upcoming wrestling championship, legalized killing. Kilbane's response is that stuff like this will happen. When asked about those who have died there... And what of those who have died at the event? Murder Brawl isn't for the weak. Jump on a grenade and you have to expect the blast to tear you to meaty blood-soaked pieces. There may be children listening. All oh, right, uh, uh, kids, uh, don't play with grenades and just blow your hands off. When we come back with Kilbane, we'll take a few calls from our listeners. So with the van, we have to shine the laser on it until the bar reaches the end. The thing is that this laser moves back and forth, and the van itself will be driving erratically in an attempt to escape from you. So trying to complete this objective, it's a practice in patience. After messing around with the van, we finally get the location, which is an abandoned office building. Kinsey also patches our phone through so that we can call into the show. Looks like we have a caller. You're on the air with Kilbane. What's your question? Listen, motherfucker, you know that tape is bullshit. I'm sorry. Do you have a question for me? Yeah. What are you gonna do when I tell your fucking eyes out? Uh, perhaps this has gone just a bit too far. I'm not sure that's a question either. It sounds more like a threat. Very astute. Okay, we need to... Ooh! Someone talked to a washed-up wrestler, and now they think they can cut a promo! I'm gonna break it down for you, Eddie. You know what calls me that?! Now, say what you want about threatening someone over the phone, but when it's someone like Boss doing that, you know, the person with the capabilities to follow through on those threats, you can't help but appreciate the badassery on display. Especially since we're moments away from taking out Kilbane. Boss and Shandi make it to the building and take out everyone guarding the interview room. Kilbane is long gone, so we decide to ask Jane where he fled to. Jane says that he mentioned something about heading north, so the duo jumps back in the helicopter and scour the streets for him. They finally track down his vehicle, and then... Gotcha. After the crash, Kilbane is nowhere to be seen, and it's revealed that the assassination was botched by Matt Miller himself. Boss and Pierce drop by Kinsey's place, and Kinsey believes that the Deckers must have fried the helicopter with an EMP. She also theorizes that if Matt has the Decker Usenet plugged into a power grid, it'll be bad all around. She'll be able to stop them if we manage to steal one of the most powerful learning computers on the continent owned by Stag. Unfortunately, Matt was listening in on the whole thing, and he and his crew now have a head start. So we head out to Stag's PR building to stop the Deckers from taking the computer. We arrive there, and the Deckers are already engaged in a gunfight with Stag. Enemy headcount in this mission is really high, so you've gotta make sure you have enough ammunition in the right upgrades before taking it on. During the shootout, Matt and Kinsey get into a fight on the intercoms, and it's pathetic. Let's just say that nothing else dates a piece of media more than the phrase epic fail. At a parking garage, Kinsey offers to call in reinforcements to help hijack the computer, but Pierce says that they have it all under control because they're about to use a tank. Kinsey understandably doesn't want them using that, but they decide to be sneaky and steal one anyways. 
Okay, following the truck on the street cam van. Oh, God, what the hell are you doing? Going after the truck? I said don't use the tape. Whoops. Uh, Kenzie, you're breaking up. No, I'm not. You're just using your mouth to pretend like you are. Okay, so this portion of the mission has some trial and error attached to it. The objective's pretty simple. The game needs you to damage the wheels of the flatbed truck holding the learning computer using the machine gun. There's one big problem, though. Pierce is with you. And that's bad. While you're in the tank, Pierce will have control over the laser. The reason why this is bad is because Pierce will blindly fire at anything and everything that moves, including the flatbed. So if you're not careful, no I'm sorry, so if Pierce is not careful, he could destroy the computer and cause you to fail the mission. After stopping the truck, we bring it back to Kinsey's place. She says she needs a chair, but the one she's looking for has to do with the supercomputer we just stole. Back at her hideout, a frustrated Kinsey tries breaking down her plan to boss and Oleg. <sighs> I'll explain it again real slow. I want to broadcast your subconscious into the Decker usernet. Then you'll be able to interact with the avatars of users and corrupt the abstract representations of data that are the cornerstone of their online operation. To do that, I need- A Nemo chair, of course. A what chair? Nemo, neurological electromagnetic on gyroscope. The KGB destroyed the only one in existence. Turns out that the Deckers have the only Nemo chair in existence and will be able to find it at this nuclear power plant over in Burns Hill. The reason why we can't just snatch the chair and leave is because its circuitry could get messed up while we try taking it off the power grid. Also, I love Kinsey even more now. You're not into classical, are you? God, no. So, so what do you listen to? Hardcore gangster rap. I don't know why I'm surprised. We're now tasked with keeping the Deckers off of Kinsey's back while she messes around with the power uplinks. It's one of those missions. After doing this two more times, we now need to get in a helicopter so that Kinsey can track down the exact location of the chair. Kinsey is able to pin down where the chair is at, which is under the main cooling tower of the power plant. We parachute inside, and according to Kinsey, the Deckers may already be destroying the chair, but that line of dialogue is kinda pointless given the lack of time limit or whatever. What we need to do is disconnect four routers placed around this spacious and admittedly aesthetically pleasing room. Once again, I'm getting huge Tron vibes from this game, with the bright neon colors emitting from different objects in the room and the computer equipment strewn about. You'd also better come to this mission with health and damage upgrades and a lot of ammunition, because you'll be battling a seemingly endless swarm of enemies while you fight your way to each router. Another reason you'd want to have those upgrades is because you have to sit through an entire animation of Boss shutting off a router while he sits there and takes each gunshot. After shutting down all the routers, the Nemo chair finally belongs to us. And as a reward for completing this mission, we've unlocked the Burns Hill reactors as a crib. You're still restricted to the penthouse area. At this point, why even bother? It's honestly baffling that the art team went through the trouble of designing such complex environments for missions like this one and the one where Boss and Zemos raid SafeWord just for the game designers to not allow the players to navigate the spaces we were just shooting people in. It would have been nice to see how the Saints transform each of these areas to their own liking. Sure, we see that on the exterior, but the interior leaves a lot to be desired. Imagine how dope the main reactor we were just in would look if the Saints threw some neon purple in that bitch and had all these computer systems and server farms sitting all over the place. Instead of something like that, all we get is yet another penthouse with a bar and some strippers thrown in for good measure. Now of course, design decisions like this happen in the world of game development for a whole laundry list of reasons. Dev teams can't just do what they want without taking various factors into consideration. Still, it would have been nice to have more elaborate cribs. Before I move on to the conclusion of the Decker's arc, I just want to say that for as much as I love Kinsey, I can't stand the way she's written. She's written as a stereotype, a computer expert who is socially awkward, doesn't get out a lot, works and sleeps in dark rooms, and talks in techno babble to the annoyance of everyone around them. I'm addressing this now because I've always found this trope in media to be very fucking annoying. Some background, I've been using computers since the age of three, at least one year after Windows XP took the world by storm. As of the making of this video, I'm currently studying CompTIA and Network and Security Plus so that I can find work in the cybersecurity field. In spite of all this though, I don't find myself sitting in badly lit rooms with a hood over my head whilst madly banging on a keyboard to the sound of EDM. 
My point is that the whole media trope of a computer genius being socially awkward and speaking in technobabble is annoying, outdated, and played out. I also hate hearing the other saints speak reluctantly about Kinsey due to her demeanor. It really doesn't hurt to ask her to break things down in simpler terms. The thing is that you can write a character like this without going off the deep end. One character I can think of is Fumi Kano from Devil Survivor 2. Without spoiling too much, Fumi is a genius computer programmer and head scientist for a national defense group in Japan. She's socially awkward and somewhat difficult to approach, but still charming and willing to hear other people out. Fumi's worldviews and philosophy may be cold and pessimistic, but she's still happy either when she's working on experiments or around close friends like Otome or Makoto. You also don't want to find yourself in her crosshairs because she'll make you regret that for sure. Especially since she has the highest magic stat in the game. When asked to break down things in simpler terms, she does get slightly frustrated, but she's more than willing to explain. Fumi is more than a mad scientist. Now, I'm not saying that Kinsey should be written as an exact carbon copy of Fumi. I'm saying that she should have been given more depth and not written as a walking, talking stereotype. Give us a few more missions to bond with Kinsey outside of the usual loop of taking the fight to the Deckers. Imagine Boss slowly starting to understand some of the stuff Kinsey does or knows, or becoming open to the idea of wanting to learn more about computing from her. Now, I know that Saints Row isn't a series with story and characters that have to be taken that seriously, but I'd like Kinsey to be better written as a character instead of having her fall victim to a tired trope. We've made it to the final mission of the Decker's Arc, and this time, we won't have to go very far to cripple them. You ready to fuck things up in virtual reality? Safer than being shot at. You can survive a gunshot, but if your mind takes too much shock in this chair, you'll go brain dead. Great plan, Kinsey. I know. So we find ourselves inside the grid, I, I mean the Decker's Usenet, and we're already off to a good start. Kinsey hasn't finished our avatar yet, so we've got to move around as a toilet and then as a sex doll. Our avatar is finally completed, and now we can get to work on disrupting the Decker's Usenet. The gun we're given is this semi-automatic arm cannon, similar to what Barrett uses in Final Fantasy VII. You can hold down the fire button to charge up your shot to deal more damage. Of course, this comes with the drawback of being left open to attack while you wait for it to charge. Despite being one of the more out there weapons in the game, it looks and feels cathartic to use, has good sound design, and the projectiles have impact. Our game plan now is to bust our way through the defenses that Matt set up, so we have to go and destroy the firewall. I have to say that I'm impressed with the visuals going on here, taking clear inspiration from Tron, but with their own twist on it. I love the vibrant yet still aggressive neon red and orange seen throughout the level, in contrast with the Deckers themselves, whom are sporting their signature neon blue. It's also fun seeing enemies explode once you take them out in this level. This mission, and a few others here in Saints Row the Third, are why I'm frustrated that the devs took away the replay feature. Now, since this is Matt's domain, he can mess with our controls, doing stuff like slowing down player movement, reversing our controls, and even changing our avatar. The devs knew exactly what they were doing by having this occur near large groups of enemies, and I can't even be mad at them for wanting to have some fun. We find ourselves at an impasse in the form of a text adventure game. I'm a huge fan of these things. I remember spending a lot of time in high school coding text adventure games in C++ and Visual Studio. So this section is pretty much a quiz, and you have to guess which answer will let you advance. If you guess wrong, you're kicked back to the start of the text adventure. Kinsey loves text adventure too, because she doesn't even want to give you the answers. Not gonna bore you with the details, but what happens is that you take a torch, walk for a little bit, and kill a fucking unicorn. Now that we're past the firewall, the next thing we need to do is take out the antivirus. Matt's none too happy about us bypassing his security, so he decides to turn us into a toilet. By the way, even as a toilet, you can still pull off those unique melee animations, which is fucking hilarious. Matt can also induce lag on boss's end, mimicking what lag would look like in an actual online game. Thankfully, it's not as frustrating as the real thing, but it can still catch you off guard. We're about to destroy the antivirus, and in order to do so, the game needs us to play Atari Combat. I'm not even kidding. It's pretty simple though. All you've gotta do is destroy the enemy tank and not take too many hits. We're back in the Usenet again, and this time Matt's changed our avatar into a sex doll. The last bit of security we need to hit is the internet security protocol. 
Also, Matt modeled this portion of the Usenet after an area seen in the in-universe TV show, Nightblade, which is pretty much the equivalent to, I guess, True Blood or Vampire Diaries. Wait, you modeled this shit off of Nightblade? It's an allegory for man's inhumanity to man. It's a shitty vampire show. I don't expect a chuckle-pop like you to appreciate your writing. I can't really talk too much shit about Matt's taste in entertainment, because I remember being 14 and thinking that Beyond Two Souls was deep. The program Colonel panics and then we're brought back to the Usenet. Before I get to the fight, let me remind you that this is the only boss battle we get in Saints Row the Third. It's a huge shame because Saints Row 2 did a good job with giving each major player a unique boss fight. With Veteran Child, you had to stun him with flash grenades in order to shoot him without hurting Shandi. Jinichi's boss fight was awesome because it altered player movement and forced you to time your attacks. I think it's fair for fans of Saints Row 2 to expect more unique boss fights with the main antagonist of Saints Row 3, especially with the way Volition was hyping them up. Now that I think about it, Matt and Kilbane don't even have their own second-in-commands, and that sucks because we could have been given some unique boss fights and more interaction between the antagonists. Matt's nowhere to be seen, until he tries ambushing us while rocking this really dope design. The fights start, and Kinsey needs us to survive against Matt until she finishes copying his avatar. Matt just flies around the arena firing projectiles whilst changing up our behavior. Now he can shrink us and make the gun weaker. There's also some pretty dope QTEs too, like hopping on the dude's back and ripping his wings off. Shit looks awesome. Kinsey finishes copying Matt's avatar, and we're finally in control of our own dragon. Or is this a wyvern? The controls have changed too. While the R2 button is a basic melee swipe with the sword, hitting L2 will have boss jump high in the air and dive bomb the ground with a spinning sword strike. L1 lets you do a quick dash, and R1 will let you shoot flames from your mouth. This is pretty awesome. I wish the Decker Usenet was used as an activity the same way Cyberblazing was. Matt gets cold feet and hides for a bit while he sends his soldiers to try and take us out. He comes back to the arena and now we're on even footing. I don't know why, but for some reason I'm reminded of Digital Devil Saga during this portion of the fight. Matt can still teleport, but he can't fly around like he did at the start. He still has those basic sword swipes and the same projectiles as before. We're then put through a quick time event that results in a sword battle that's choreographed pretty damn good. The fight ends, and we finally confront Matt Miller himself. Bye, Matt. Ah! I can clear your name! Prove that you didn't destroy that bridge! I'm sure Kinsey can figure it out. I literally have the world at my fingertips. It's a little vague, Matt. Gotta do better. You tell me the name of a company, and it becomes the property of the Saints. You get your empire back, and I get to walk away. Kid, now we talking. Matt must have dumped a lot of points into his speech stat, because he manages to convince boss of all people to not fucking kill him. So we're given a choice. We can get discounts on vehicle customization, or discounts on weapon upgrades. Choose the weapon upgrades. Customizing cars is nice and all, but it's better to be able to have faster access to weapon upgrades. So what happens to Matt Miller? He leaves the syndicate. No joke. Not only was Matt able to talk boss out of killing him, but he was able to convince Kilbane, the same person who murdered Kiki because he felt disrespected by her, to let him leave the syndicate unscathed. This part of the story also draws controversy from fans because of the fact that Boss was known for leaving no stone unturned, no matter who you are. My theory for the writers allowing Matt to live is that they likely didn't want to draw unneeded controversy to themselves for writing a story where a gang leader murders a teenager. Given the fears that Volition had when making the first game, I could kind of see where they're coming from. At the same time though, I do think that such a fear is silly because you've got shows like The Wire, where countless teenagers and young adults are violently murdered in damn near every episode of the show. This issue, if it was an issue in the first place, could have been avoided by making Matt a young adult, roughly the same age as Shogo. Anyways, Matt's talking with Kilbane, who's disappointed that he's leaving because they'll lose out on some IT people. The thing is that Kilbane's actually proud of Matt for sticking with him even after Philippe died. Despite this, Matt feels like it's time to move on, and he's upfront with Kilbane about the fact that he's scared of dying. Kilbane understands Matt's worries and allows him to leave with his life. Listen, Kilbane may be a warmonger who doesn't care about the rules of engagement, but he's not a total monster. According to a newscast from Jane Valderrama, after leaving Steelport, Matt swore off of modern technology and joined the Neo-Luddite movement. From what his former associates have said, he had always been fascinated by Neo-Luddism, and after his run-in with the Saints, 
he decided that it was time to make a change. And that marks the end of the Decker storyline. I have mixed feelings about this arc. On one hand, we got some really fun and aesthetically pleasing missions, like the raid on the power plant and the attack on the Decker's Usenet. There are tons of things that I didn't like about this arc, though. The conflict between the Saints and the Deckers feels more like a war of attrition regarding who has the better tech. I also think that Matt was just playing with this food, you know, toying with the Saints because he gets a kick out of it. And at the end of all that, Matt still survives. I know that he's 16, but I don't think it should be that easy to leave a criminal organization like the Syndicate. I mean, have you seen what Kazuma Kiryu had to go through in order to even think about leaving the Dojima family in Yakuza 0? What's also weird is that the whole plot point about the Saints being blamed for the bridge attack hardly ever comes up again. We don't even get a reaction from Monica Hughes regarding the fake video of the Saints at the bridge. I think that a few missions should have been dedicated to the Saints trying to clear their name. This in turn should have had more of an effect on the open world, like having pedestrians making rude remarks towards you, or some overzealous people picking a fight with boss in the streets. This was also a chance for the writers to lean more into tying the bridge incident with the conflict with the Deckers, since Matt was directly responsible for the doctored video. Now that I think about it, almost nobody ever brings up the bridge thing again. You'd expect a lot more people, especially the other saints, to be talking about it. Was there gonna be a plot where we deal with public backlash and accusations of terrorism? This is yet another prime example of the game's story introducing something and not doing much or anything at all with it. All in all, the Decker storyline feels like filler. Not bad filler, but like the writers couldn't think of some kind of engaging conflict between these guys, so we got what was shown instead. Another way I'd improve this chapter would be to have Kinsey's rivalry with Matt be more personal, since the Deckers were the ones responsible for her getting fired from the FBI. That would have given Kinsey something to fight for, and the storyline for this gang would finally have something resembling stakes. To conclude, the Deckers arc was fun, but full of missed potential. So we finally made it to the finale. I decided to combine the Stag and the Luchadors arc because it'd be too much to split these two storylines into separate chapters. I also only covered the first two missions of the Stag arc in the previous chapter just so I could get their introduction out of the way. Still, this chapter's gonna be packed. After a memorial bridge built in her husband's name is destroyed, Senator Monica Hughes is successful with getting Congress to begin the Stag Initiative, whom is now occupying Steelport. With the Saints pushed out of their headquarters in downtown, they decide that the best defense is a good offense and start pushing back against the paramilitary outfit. The war with Stag has only just begun. Boss rings Pierce asking if he's found a way to hurt Stag, and Pierce tells us that he has a plan, but it also involves Viola. So we go and swing by a comic book store to see what he's cooking up. Pierce wants to draw out Stag by kidnapping Josh Burke. Since Josh is their mascot, an A-list one I might add, they'd have no choice but to come after us. Once they do, we can get the drop on them. A starstruck fan nervously approaches us asking for an autograph, and we find out that Gat has his own line of comic books. Turns out that Gat sold his likeness to Ultor, and they're making a movie out of his comic, Gangsters in Space. Anyways, back to planning. We're gonna need Viola for this job because... Look, we lay the right bait, he'll come to us. That's why I need you and the new girl. My name's Viola. Your name's the Bloody Cannoness. You can't be serious. Works for me. So now Boss and Viola are dressed as characters from Nightblade. What we need to do is infiltrate the stag PR building that Josh is at while we're in disguise so that we can kidnap him. Can I just say that I've lost count of the number of Trojan Horse-style missions that are in Saints Row the Third? First it was stripper assassins, then it was Boss pretending to get sold off as a sex slave, and now we're infiltrating Stag disguised as comic book characters. During this part of the mission, we can't do anything that'll draw attention to ourselves, like attack someone or gain any kind of notoriety, or the mission will be failed. Once we're at the PR building, we can't take out our weapons. This part of the mission is pretty much a repeat of the police station mission from the Sons of Somni arc in Saints Row 2. For the moment, we just gotta keep our cool until we make it to whatever room Josh is in. 
We find Josh warming up, and before he can say anything, Boss knocks him out with a nasty right hook. So now we've got to fight our way out of the building. Since we're carrying Josh on our back, movement speed is reduced, forcing you to find cover and keep close range engagements to a minimum. Because of that, you're gonna want to come to this mission with upgrades to your health bar and damage intake. I remember playing this mission when I was 12 and getting frustrated because I was too dumb to remember to purchase upgrades. After taking the elevator, we find that the entrance is blocked and we've got to look for another way out. So we enter a parking garage, force Josh into a car at gunpoint, and retreat to Saints HQ. On the way to HQ, we've got to put up with being pursued by Stag. Josh wakes up and we let him know that he's been kidnapped. He initially puts up a fight, but only complies because Boss promises that he'll get to see Shondi again. Don't get your hopes up, Josh. I mean, have you seen what happened to Veteran Child? Cyrus walks into the PR center, and he's greeted by the sight of dead bodies of civilians. Discovering that Josh has been taken, Cyrus gets Monica Hughes on the phone, and she's pissed about the kidnapping, and orders him to rescue Josh. Then the cutscene just ends. Stag suffers from the same problem as the Syndicate. Their cutscenes are brief, and the relationship between the main antagonist is hardly fleshed out. We the player are able to gather that Cyrus and Kia are close allies whom are willing to go as far as they can to put an end to gang activity around Steelport. They both carry that stone cold by the books attitude, and they still operate by the books, but you can tell that if their capabilities weren't limited by Monica Hughes, they'd take extreme measures to eradicate all the gangs in the city. Stag's cutscenes are too short for their own good, and just when it seems like we're about to get something interesting out of Cyrus or Kia, the scene ends. Another thing we don't get to see is how all the other gangs around Steelport are handling Stag occupying this place. Focus is only on the Saints. What we should have gotten was something like Kilbane worrying about Stag and devising plans with them in mind. We also should have seen more of the Deckers waging cyber and conventional warfare against Stag as well. There was some of that in the mission with the learning computer, but that's about it. Stag's conflicts with the other gangs is pretty much non-existent. Next is my second favorite mission in the game. Stag Party. It starts with Boss calling Shondi's phone, only for Oleg to pick up. The reason Shondi's away from her phone is because she's busy rejecting Josh's romantic advances. Shondi then snatches her phone from Oleg and tells us that he won't stop asking for her phone number. You'd have a better chance at proposing to a sim with shitty traits than getting with Shondi. Boss promises that everything will be handled and asks her to put Oleg back on the phone. Oleg informs us that Stag still thinks we're at the old HQ and, well, you guys still are. What we're gonna do is use this to our advantage and spring a trap. Over at HQ, Pierce and Oleg are back to their game of chess, and Shondi has Josh at gunpoint. Not to make sure he doesn't run, but in case he tries anything with her. Dude, at this point, just take the hint. Pierce tells us he has the charges ready, and then Oleg messes up their chess game on purpose. Of all people, it's hilarious that Oleg is near checkmate against Pierce. Preparation is finished, and it's time to wage war. Pierce can't join us right now because he'll be somewhere else in town picking up something special. We're then given an infinite number of Molotovs and told to go to the PR center. What we're gonna do is pick a fight with Stag and trick them into chasing us back to our base in downtown. Boss arrives there, sets the banners on fire, and hauls ass to HQ. Oleg calls and says that he's prepared some car bombs and warns us to be careful about not setting them off when we get close. He'll also be monitoring Stag's movements from the security room. Boss makes it back and takes the elevator upstairs. Once inside, we're given an RPG and Oleg tells us to fire a rocket at the bomb waste cars the moment a stag squad gets close. We shoot the bombs and are rewarded with a series of spectacular explosions that consume the whole block. You may have also noticed that this portion of the building looks new and that's because it was built exclusively for this level. You're never gonna see it outside of this mission. Sometime later, Viola gets overwhelmed by gunfire from Stag, and the game needs us to help her out. After saving Viola, we're back to setting off more car bombs and fending off enemies. We take out some snipers across the street, and we've gotta head to the north side of the building to destroy some tanks. The tanks are dealt with, and Pierce calls us saying that he's on his way back with the new gear. So we head back down to street level and fight off Stag whilst escorting Pierce back to HQ. You've gotta be fast when doing this, because Stag will not hold back against either of you. They'll be coming after you with full force, tank cannons, lasers, everything. 
Once back inside, we're introduced to a new weapon. It's a laser targeting system that allows you to pinpoint coordinates for an airstrike. This thing is devastating when used and can put an end to any gunfight you find yourself in. Just be wary of the explosions when you use this thing. Pierce deserves a lot of credit for picking up this gadget. It was definitely worth the trouble. The battle continues, with Stag calling in VTOLs and tanks only to lose them to every single airstrike we call in. Stag breaks into the building, but they're quickly eliminated before they can do anything else. However, the Saints have reached their breaking point and Stag finally has them overwhelmed. Feeling the pressure, Boss orders everyone to go to the penthouse. Once there, Cyrus confronts Boss on the landing pad, but Boss has Josh at gunpoint and says that they'll give him back safely if Stag leaves Steelport. Cyrus doesn't back down and says that Stag is here to stay, but he makes us an offer. If Boss returns Josh, Cyrus will take the heat off the Saints and instead focus more on the Syndicate. So in gameplay terms, we have two choices. If we keep Josh, we get him as a homie, which is a pretty useless reward since not a lot of people even call in homies in the open world in the first place. This is more of a punishment than it is a reward. Just give Josh to Stag. Unless you really love Josh, you know, this incompetent, underused, and underdeveloped character, and want to have him by your side in the open world, there's no reason to keep him. Boss decides to give Josh back to Cyrus, but despite this, the commander still orders his squad to open fire on the Saints. Kia, do you read me? I see congratulations are in order, Commander. Not quite. The Saints are still at large. I'm sending some intel over. I need leverage on the Saints. Bring in the target for questioning. They're going to run to ground. Digging them out won't be easy. If it were easy, I wouldn't waste your time. Understood, sir. I'll find her. So guess what? You know that building that Stag just blew up, Saints HQ? You can still use it as a crib. At this point, the downtown crib should have been completely locked until we finish the Stag storyline. Like I've said before, allowing the player to continue using this crib takes away from what just happened. Hell, it makes it feel like everything we've seen and done up to this point never happened at all. What was the point in even showing a scene like that? Like I said in the previous chapter, I'd assume that the developer's rationale behind this decision was because they thought that players would be attached to this crib and wouldn't want to be forced to part ways with it. Once again, this is just speculation. Were that the case though, the player still has similar looking cribs like the Burns Hill reactors. Sure, Burns Hill is a bit farther from a lot of mission markers, but the penthouse itself still looks similar to Saints HQ and even the safe word crib. On the topic of Josh, Josh Burke as a character is really strange. I don't mean strange in terms of personality, although that is true. I mean strange in terms of writing. When we first meet him, he's a ride-along for the Saints so that he can get ready for a role he's doing in a movie about them. He's clumsy, incompetent, and not really the brightest. And after the bank heist, Josh is absent for a majority of the story. Now, there's nothing wrong with characters being taken out of a story for an extensive period of time. The thing is that Josh's absence has little rhyme or reason. It feels like the writers had a cool idea for a character on the spot, but when he was finalized, they couldn't figure out how to fit him into the story. So as a way to compensate for Josh's absence, they just have him in promos for Nightblade, which is that presumably shitty True Blood or Buffy ripoff he stars in. They could have given him more to do in either the main plotline or a subplot of his own. Maybe have him roll with the Saints for just a little bit longer before he tucks tail and works with Stag because he feels more safe and secure around them. Josh is yet another wasted character. Say what you want about Carlos kicking off the plot only to be given terrible screen time, but at least he did a lot to contribute to the story. We hit up Shondi to see how she's doing, and then out of nowhere, Shondi is snatched off the phone, and we hear Kia's voice. Boss calls Pierce and lets him know that shondi has been kidnapped, and they start devising a plan to bring her back home safe. Get ready, ladies and gents, and hold on to your suspension of disbelief. This next mission is gonna be something. Boss meets up with Pierce and Viola at Image as Designed. The plan is for Boss to get cosmetic surgery so that he can look and sound like Commander Cyrus Temple. I'm not making this up. Makes you wonder though, if cosmetic surgery in this world is so advanced, to the point of being able to completely clone other people, why didn't one of the Morningstar get surgery to look like Pierce or Shondi so that they could get close to Boss? That's not the only part of the plan. 
Boss is going to be using Viola and Pierce as bait, bringing them aboard the carrier as prisoners so that we'll have some help rescuing Shandi. Some time passes, and we leave Image as designed now disguised as Commander Cyrus Temple. Just like the mission where we kidnap Josh, we can't do stuff like attack other people or we'll fail. Hey Volition, could you guys come up with gameplay and story setups that don't involve the whole Trojan horse thing? On the way to the Thermopylae, Boss is having too much fun with his new look. Are we convincing enough like this? Considering I want to stab your ass right now? Yeah, I'd say it works. Maybe I'll just leave your ass in the brig. I should slap that face right off of you. You threaten your commander? <sighs> this isn't giving me any confidence. Once we make it to Sierra Point, you know, that military base we attacked at the start of the game, we hop on an aircraft and make our way to the Thermopylae. Aboard the carrier, the plan is going along smoothly. Welcome back, sir. What's up? Boss hands the two off to be booked, and we're given the riveting task of slightly pushing the left analog stick forward. Uh, oh, I mean following Kia. We're told that Stag has not been able to get any info about the Saints from Shandi, and she's not even close to breaking. We're also told that R&D has sent a prototype for a jet-propelled cycle. R&D has also made improvements to their tank's firepower and armor, and they've developed satchel charges for the troops. We can only approve of two of these projects, though. This is pretty much the game saying that you're about to unlock some new gear. The duo makes it to the computer, and we're taken to a menu to sign off on the projects. Me, personally, I always go with the flying motorcycle and the satchel charges. I never get the tank upgrade because I don't find myself in tanks that often, so it's useless to me. After the projects are approved, the real Cyrus Temple contacts Kia and says that he's on his way back to interrogate Shandi again. The plan's pretty much ruined and Kia tries fending us off. Boss escapes with a keycard and heads towards the brig. There's a fuck ton of resistance you've gotta put up with. You're gonna have to play this smart by crouching and utilizing cover if possible. These dudes are everywhere, and you've gotta engage with them in a really enclosed space. Trying to fight them like you're on the mainland will only lead to a quick death. Boss eventually finds the security room and unlocks access to all cell doors. We free the saints, and now we have to escape the carrier. Shandi suggests blowing the thing up before making our great escape as a bit of a middle finger to Stag. She tells us that the best place to do some damage is a room called Reactor Control, since she heard some of the troops talking about how dangerous it is. So we take a detour and kill our way there. After clearing the room out, Boss shoots a console, and the carrier becomes unstable, getting rocked by a bunch of explosions. We're now put on a three minute timer to haul ass out of here. Don't stop for anything. If you have to engage with an enemy, go for headshots, and make sure those shots land. The crew makes it to the bay, steals an aircraft, and escapes the Thermopylae unharmed. Back on shore, we watch as the carrier gets destroyed by massive explosions and capsizes into the waters of Steelport. Pierce thinks that they might have gone a little too far, but it doesn't matter. All we have left now is Kilbane. As for Stag, they're really pissed about what we just did. Twelve hours later, martial law is officially declared in Steelport. Stag's presence is increased, and all vertical lift bridges in town have been permanently raised. Monica says that she knew martial law was inevitable because she knew that the saints were unpredictable. Cyrus himself believes that the mayor of Steelport will fall in line as well. Kia updates Cyrus, letting him know that they're gonna have the whole city locked down in 72 hours. Stag is done fucking around. So Steelport just got a hell of a lot more annoying to navigate. With the bridges being raised, you'd better make sure you land those jumps correctly. If you land the wrong way, your vehicle will get rolled upside down and you'll need to find a new one. The worst part about this is that even if you make it to the post game, the bridges will still be raised. Never really got the point of that. Stag's gone, so why leave the bridges raised in the post game? All this does is act as an unnecessary obstacle for the player. Even though martial law has been declared, it doesn't feel like it. I know that I've brought up this point before, but if you're trying to sell Stag's presence in the city, go big or go home. Say what you want about the DUP from Infamous Second Son, but as much of a joke they were, at least there was stuff around Seattle that let the player know that they're the ones in charge. Here in Steelport, outside of the bridges being raised and increased Stag presence, it's almost as if martial law were never declared in the first place. This also would have been a great chance to introduce some more enemy types within Stag. The only specialist enemies they have are basic as hell, wielding either a riot shield or a sniper. I'm getting off track though. Boss calls Viola and says that he's tired of waiting to go after Kilbane, and it's time to take him out. 
At the bar, Boss asks for suggestions on taking out the Syndicate Kingpin. Viola says that destroying his reputation is the best way to get at Kilbane. If we tear off his mask, he's no longer Kilbane to the world. He's Eddie Pryor, a fate worse than death in his eyes. Now that's some good attention to detail. So for those not in the know, in Mexican wrestling, better known as Lucha Libre, the mask is really important. It's not just a gimmick or persona, but a whole identity for wrestlers in this scene. Having your mask removed is not only seen as shame of the highest caliber, but the ultimate act of disrespect on part of the person doing the removal. Not only did you just remove their mask, but you removed their entire identity. Luchadors, the real-life wrestlers, not the in-game faction, also preferred to be called by their stage name as opposed to their given name. That's why Kilbane doesn't take too kindly to being referred to as Eddie. The reason why I'm waxing poetic about Mexican wrestling is because some of the customs play a part in shaping who Kilbane is and why unmasking him is our goal. Getting back to the plan, Boss doesn't feel comfortable with snatching a victory like this from Angel. Not only that, but Kilbane outright refuses to fight Angel in the first place, so we're gonna have to kill the competition. We're in a helicopter now, and wielding a new weapon courtesy of Kinsey. This device is called the RC Possessor. It's a gun that, when fired at a vehicle, takes control of it for a certain distance. This thing is useless. I could peer into one out of an infinite number of multiverses and not find a single legitimate reason for using this thing outside of this mission. What is there to gain from taking control of an enemy's vehicle during free roam? Unless this is Watchdogs, there's no reason to have this thing in your inventory while out in the open world. The reason why we're using the Possessor here is because we want to take control of the other contestants' vehicles and make their deaths accidental. As for why we need them to be accidents, Kilbane would outright cancel his appearance at Murder Brawl if we straight up killed them. Plus, we need these guys dead so that Kilbane would have no choice but to square up against Angel. Alright folks, get those hepatitis vaccines updated because the blood will be flying soon at Murder Ball 31. Right you are, Zach, and who better to announce the official lineup than the champion himself, Kilbane? Oh, you know, opponents have been arriving from all over to face their fears and meet the architect of their demise. So stay tuned as the press conference will be coming to you live from the Three Count Casino within the hour. I can't wait. First target is Mad Mangler Merle Roberts. Despite being fierce in the ring, he's a pretty laid-back dude. Yeah, we're about to change his public image real fast. The game needs us to run over several pedestrians with this SUV so that everyone thinks he had a bout of roid rage. Once we're finished using the sidewalk as a raceway, we go and trash the Mad Mangler's vehicle into some gas station pumps, giving the laid-back luchador a fiery demise. Next on our hit list is Christopher the Clubber Johnson. He should be partying at a beach. A breaking news broadcast cuts in, and Jane Valderrama reports on Merle's death, with the events before and after his demise being described by eyewitnesses as a rage-induced vehicular rampage. Our tactic seems to be working. We get to the water, take control of one of the boats, then we slam it onto the beach where a bunch of partygoers are hanging out, putting an end to the clubber's career. Our next victim is Trash Can Teddy. I don't care what anyone says, that's a pretty dope wrestling name. It legit sounds like something from Attitude Era WWE. Another breaking newscast plays and reports on the untimely demise of the clubber. Right now, Trash Can Teddy is on a helicopter tour of Steelport, so we take control of a nearby helicopter and crash it into his. Our final target is El Presidente. Making this a vehicular accident is out of the question, since Presidente has a stag escort out of fear of Kilbane murdering him before the match. I mean, he's half right. So what we're gonna do is take control of a stag tank and go crazy with it in his presence. A news report about the previous accident plays, reminding us of our work. At Wesley Cutter Airport, we remotely hijack a tank and start chasing down Presidente. Gotta give this dude credit for being pragmatic, since he's staying inside a tank in case Kilbane and crew show up with RPGs or whatever. One nice thing about this portion of the mission is that even if your tank is destroyed, you can still take control of a new one and keep the chase going. You might also find yourself doing this a few times because Stag will melt away a tank's health with their laser rifles. Also, while I have time to mention it, you gotta love how Jane is already on site ready to report some crazy shit like this. With this kind of work ethic, they need to make Jane lead editor for whatever news station she's working for. If it bleeds, it leads, am I right? 
El Presidente is finally killed and we're brought over to a press conference for the event. Ladies and gentlemen, the Stillwater Butcher has graced us with their presence. You want to fight the best? You fight me. The best? <laughs> the best is beating Sway the Spider God in a Tijuana scaffold match. The best is defending the world title 13 times in one night. The best is winning a last man standing match with two broken legs! Trust me, little Icarus. You're flying too close to the sun. Oh my god, quit being a bitch and put your mask up. If you want to be broken by the walking apocalypse, I will gladly oblige you. Tell me that's not awesome. Kilbane willfully invites Boss to a press conference, flexes his accolades, only to get bitched out by Boss in a single sentence. You can also tell that Kilbane is trying his absolute damnedest to keep his composure during the whole thing. In the mind of Kilbane, killing Boss is way too easy. He doesn't just want to kill Boss and leave like nothing happened, he wants the entire nation to witness his defeat just before his ultimate demise. This is not a battle over territory, money, or business. This is a battle of pride. Now, I mentioned this in the prologue, but this is why I wish we spent a little bit more time with Angel during his introductory missions. Hearing him recount his experiences with Kilbane would not only give us an idea of what their relationship was like, but the exposition would add some more weight to their rivalry. Of course, this is Hulk Hogan voicing Angel, and that's expensive. I do also wish there was more to this rivalry when it comes to Boss and Kilbane. Someone coming off of Saints Row 2 would be expecting a similar back and forth just like the Brotherhood arc, where Boss and Kilbane would be firing back at each other until the wrestling match. But no. Instead, we just get Boss bitching out Kilbane at his own press conference. This is also why all three syndicate leaders needed lieutenants, because there's no sense of escalation to any of these rivalries in this game. In a post-mission news report by Jane Valderrama, she says that Murder Brawl 31 will have fewer matches thanks to the unexpected demise of the contestants, but the highly anticipated match between the Stillwater Butcher and Kilbane will still go on. For now though, let's switch plots for a moment and see what our buddies at Stag are up to. Boss hits up Kinsey and asks if she's got more info on Stag. The one good bit of info Kinsey has is that Stag is transporting cargo in an air convoy. So Boss tells Kinsey to call Viola and to meet him at the airport because we're gonna need Viola's plane for this one. In the skies over Steelport, Boss and Viola stand in the cargo bay overlooking Stag's plane, and Boss jumps out, lands on the aircraft, and forces his way in. The gate in front of us is locked, so Boss goes the other way and looks for something that might be able to blast it open. So the overall goal with this job is to steal some good hardware from Stag. The game needs us to search the crates around the cargo bay for something substantial. Boss eventually finds this strange looking gun and goes back to test it on the gate. Let's just say that this was well worth the search. This weapon is called the Sonic Boom. It's able to deliver an explosive blast depending on how long you hold down the charge button. If you let the Sonic Boom charge to max and hit an enemy with it, they get turned into red mist. This is some shit you'd see in Doom or Wolfenstein. Unfortunately, it's not really a practical weapon. As pointed out, the Sonic Boom is most useful when fully charged, which I get, there are tons of weapons like that in other games. The thing about the Sonic Boom is that even after delivering the charged up shot, the payoff really isn't worth it. I see this thing as more of a gimmick weapon to have fun with or to show off to your friends rather than something to put to use during the more serious shootouts. You're better off using shotguns than this thing. Despite all of its shortcomings, this would be enough to put a smile on John Romero's face. Getting back to the mission, Boss blasts his way past the fence, fights off a bunch of stag, and gets to the door of the cockpit. Then he stupidly decides to fire off a blast at it, completely destroying the cockpit, which depressurizes the plane and sends it sailing towards the ground. Boss doesn't seem to have a good relationship with airplanes. It's time for plan B, and the game is giving us less than a minute to jump out the plane. With no parachute in sight, Boss hops inside a tank in the hopes that the steel giant will protect him from the fall. So this segment is pretty much a repeat of the second mission in the game. You're free falling and have to swat enemies out of the air whilst your movement is somewhat restricted. Except this time though, we're getting battered by tank blasts, and they've got some VTOLs thrown in for good measure. 
A few VTOLs and several tanks later, Boss spots another stag cargo plane and bails from the tank in an attempt to hijack it, but one of the wings explodes and it's back to trying to land safely. Boss manages to slip inside the hatch of a tank and waits for the landing. Yes, that is correct. An outbreak of poisonous gas has turned everyone on Arapis Island into zombies. I feel like Volition knew that they had already gone too far with the addition of laser weapons and decided that they might as well add zombies because why not? It's a strange addition though. Zombies? Zombie media was huge in the late 2000s and the early 2010s. The Walking Dead was drawing millions of viewers per episode, Call of Duty Zombies was huge back then, and thousands would gather for annual zombie walks in major cities. Which makes me wonder, did the writers add zombies to the mix because they were popular at the time? Again, this is such a bizarre addition to the story. It's so odd that I can't even begin to find any more words to express how weird of a move this was. We get on the phone with Viola, and she's setting up a meeting between us and Mayor Reynolds of Steelport. Turns out that he needs our help. Boss initially dismisses the meet, but Viola makes a good point and says that if we get on his good side, it'll benefit us in the long run. Yeah, remember how that went in Saints Row 1? I can see why Boss has trust issues with mayors. Look, sweetie, I'll fuck with whoever I want to fuck with. I mean, who does this guy think he is? Viola, is this the kid you were talking about? Bert fucking Reynolds? Who else could keep this town running? Besides, I love my constituents. Yes, that's right. The mayor of Steelport is Burt Reynolds. The Burt Reynolds. Also, rest in peace to the guy. Burt needs our help with that zombie outbreak on Arapis Island. It also turns out that Boss never told anybody about this. Oh yeah, in this mission, this is all we're gonna get out of Burt Reynolds for the entire game. I'd imagine that Burt Reynolds even glaring at Volition's office was enough for them to start bleeding millions. One more mission with Burt, and they'd have to declare Chapter 7, especially with Hulk Hogan doing voice work. We arrive at the spot, and what we need to do is find three of the containers leaking the poisonous gas and throw them into the water to neutralize them. Yes, because this totally won't genocide entire underwater ecosystems. Okay, I'm just being nitpicky now. You're also gonna need the sonic boom in order to submerge the containers. The devs must have realized how useless that gun is if they're trying to shoehorn it in one mission later. So yeah, we're fighting zombies now. These guys can take quite a few bullets, but do not let them get too close to you. If they grab you, you're forced into a QTE, and it's really annoying. One weird thing about these zombies is that they seem to just spontaneously catch fire. I've never been able to find an explanation for this, it just happens. So that's something else to watch out for if you, for whatever reason, find yourself back on Arapis Island after this point in the story. Okay, I might have been a little too hard on the sonic boom because this thing is good for clearing out a group of zombies closing in on your position. Where it falls apart in this mission is that while you're charging up the next shot to clear the horde chasing you, you're constantly moving backwards and checking your surroundings for other zombies. This can complicate things if you do spot another horde because now your focus has shifted to not being attacked from both sides. My advice, just run. Go straight to the objectives. Do not engage with enemies unless absolutely necessary. We sink the first container, and Viola calls in a panicked state, yelling for Boss to come help her. Okay, so since we're dealing with zombies, the number one rule that should have been followed is don't split up. After slowly running across the island, we find and rescue Viola and get back to searching for the containers. We submerge the second container, but we've got to take a detour. The hose on Boss's mask is damaged, so we need to get it fixed at a repair shop. 
So we're put on a two minute timer to make it there before boss turns. At the repair shop, we've gotta protect Viola for what feels like the longest 40 seconds in the world. Don't let these guys close in on Viola, because if they're on fire, Viola will take more damage. Our mask is repaired, and we continue the search for the last container. After sending it underwater, Mayor Reynolds calls boss and tells us that if we get this done, we'll have the backing of the Steelport Municipality, SWAT teams, favors from the Chief of Police, and help from the Mayor himself. Whatever we want, Mayor Reynolds can get it for us. Then Oleg calls us with the worst idea in the world. He says that we'll be able to use the zombies to take the fight to the enemy. All we need is a sample of the virus before we completely destroy it. Yes, Oleg, the KGB agent, in his infinite wisdom, wants to let zombies outside this very island. Nigga, have you played Dying Light? It's a miracle the virus is even contained here in the first place. Once we're inside the chemical truck, we're given the choice between having zombie homies or favors from Mayor Reynolds. This decision is up there with the one with Stag and Josh, in that it's really stupid. Why in the world would you choose zombie homies over something as useful as open world benefits? Again, I've never had to use homies in the open world in all my years of playing the Saints Row games, so having zombie homies is completely useless to me. The truck is thrown into the water, and everything's good. Nah, I'm kidding. Arapis Island's gonna be like this for the rest of the game. Sometime later, Commander Cyrus finds himself on the island, and Monica Hughes is pissed at him. She's mad at his, I guess, lack of results? I don't know. Cyrus once again begs Monica to authorize use of the Daedalus, but she refuses. Even if Congress approved, Homeland Security wouldn't be so happy about it. Monica says that things are getting too out of control, and she's gonna come to Steelport. This scene is kind of wasted thanks to its brevity. It's just Cyrus and crew slaughtering zombies, and the only thing driving the plot forward is Monica saying that she's coming to town. Also, outside of the post-mission news report, the whole zombie thing is never brought up again. One of the boroughs gets turned into 28 days later and nobody else brings this up. I will say that upon replaying Saints Row the Third, even before replaying it for this video, that after the events of this game, the city of Steelport is worse off once the Saints come to town. The Saints have invaded a military base, let a giant steel ball run loose throughout the city, got Stag involved, pushed Stag to the point of declaring martial law throughout the city and enforcing borough-wide lockdowns. And now Boss has left an entire island uninhabitable because he was too stupid to properly plan out a raid on Stag's supply line. You could make the argument that the Saints have done similar shit in Stillwater, and that's true. In the last two games, the Saints blew up Kingdom Come Records and the Ronin Hotel. They also set fire to several buildings in the projects in an attempt to destroy Samdi drug labs. Then they got the civilian populace caught in the crossfire in the underground mall during the finale of the Samdi arc. Despite that, the Saints in the last two games somehow managed to not make Stillwater a living hell by the end of things. The Saints in this game, though, it feels like Boss is grossly negligent this time around. Even Pierce thought that they went too far by blowing up and capsizing Stag's aircraft carrier. My point is that by the end of this game, Steelport is a major hellhole thanks to the Saints. I know that these guys are anti-heroes, but even as an anti-hero, you've gotta have some notion of self-awareness to know that you're doing too much. Boss is on the phone with Angel asking for advice on how to take on Kilbane. Angel's advice? Don't fight him. This is Angel's battle, and he believes that this is his chance to redeem himself after living with years-long shame of losing against Kilbane and disappearing from the spotlight. Angel wants to make things right for himself. Before Angel gets in the ring with his longtime rival, he wants to reclaim his honor and tells us to meet him at Three Count, a flagship casino owned by Kilbane himself. At the casino, Angel says that he doesn't want to steal back his mask. He wants to fight his way towards it so that this victory feels earned. The first thing we need to do is draw out the guy who knows where the mask is by destroying slot machines. This part of the mission is pretty much a repeat of the attack on the Ronin's casino. So we go around destroying slot machines, and eventually the manager comes out. We grab him, and he tells us that the mask is in a vault behind the teller cages. Angel admits that he felt like he wasn't worthy enough to get his mask back, which is why he didn't bother retrieving it earlier. After being recruited by the saint, he felt like this was his calling to take back what once belonged to him. We make it to the vault, and Angel finally reclaims his mask after all these years. Here it is. Are you sure this is the right one? I know every curve, every color, every mark on this mask. Then put it on, let's get the fuck out of here. Angel de la Muerte is reborn!
Before we leave, Angel wants to send a message to Kilbane by destroying all the statues of him scattered throughout the casino. Guy's got an ego the size of this building if he has that many statues modeled after him in this casino alone. Not much happens during all this either. We find all six statues, destroy them, and Three Count Casino belongs to us. Now that that's out of the way, we have a match to get to. Tonight's been a great night, and it's not slowing up, Bobby. An incredible night, Zach. And now, it's time for the main event. I can't wait. Let's do it. <laughs> there he is, Bobby. Eddie Kilbane Pryor, the walking apocalypse himself. You can't help but wonder how the Stillwater Butcher can't compete. I'll tell you, Zach, this psycho is a complete whack job. You know, when he came out of the womb, this guy literally choked out the doctor with his own umbilical cord. He's that fucking sick. Wait, oh my god, look at that. It's Angel de la Muerte. Angel de la Muerte, the second half of a pale riders, sometimes regarded as the herald of a walking apocalypse. The youngest wrestler to ever win the Super K Cup is here in the Steel Fort Arena. History is writing itself tonight, Zach. After his questionable loss to Kilbane years ago, Angel dropped off the face of the earth. If you're a fan of Murder Brawl, this is shaping up to be the best night of your life. And here it is, the long-awaited rematch between Angel de la Muerte and Kilbane. There's still work that needs to be done. We have to stay ringside and prevent Kilbane's goons from interfering with the match. What they'll do is try distracting the referee, which, by the way, real surprising that Murder Brawl even has one. Just like Fight for New York, the audience will occasionally throw in weapons that you can use. Given how already broken and overpowered your melee attacks are, take advantage of this. We fend off more of Kilbane's thugs, and the match seems to take a turn. Oh my god, the <gasps> angel is out of the ring! I can't believe this, Bobby. This is punishing to watch. The luchadors are manhandling angels. This is sick. He's getting kicked around like a sack full of dead puppies. Oh, geez. Wait, the Butcher of Stillwater is making his way towards Angel. How much can one person be expected to... Oh my god, a chainsaw! What the f***? Oh my god! That's right, we get a chainsaw. We gotta keep these dudes away from Angel and slice up anyone even thinking about trying to get close to him. I also love how the FCC in this world is still so strict that they're willing to allow broadcast of shows where real people lose their lives in gory fashion, but saying the F word is still taking it too far. Angel's down for the counts and we're gonna have to finish this match in his honor. This is what the audience came to see. The Butcher of Stillwater taking on the Walking Apocalypse. Hitting Kilbane with your fist is out of the question, so you've gotta go after him with melee weapons. If you get caught in a QTE and succeed, you're able to hit Kilbane with some pretty nasty reversals. Once Kilbane is stunned, you can hop on his back and steer him around the ring. You gotta keep hitting the punch button if you wanna stay on though. The goal is to steer him into the turnbuckle, deliver some punishment of our own, and knock him out of the ring. After going through this twice, Kilbane decides to take five and sends in his goons to fight us in the ring. I think you can already guess the outcome. Kilbane returns to the ring, goes through what happened last time, and the battle reaches its climax. Ready for your close-up? Wait! I'll give you the secret of the Apocryphist! Just leave me my mask! Kilbane, you're going to make sure no! oh, wow. It changes Angel the Arctic as Kilbane we have seen the face of the walking apocalypse, and to be honest, it's a man with a receding hairline. That's right, we've unmasked Kilbane, oh I'm sorry, Eddie, and helped Angel close a chapter on this part of his life. In case you're wondering about the rewards though, if you unmask Eddie, you gain his mask, but it has the ability to fucking set people on fire if you taunt them. If you don't unmask him, you'll gain a weapon of his called the Apocryphus, which are the most powerful melee weapons in the game. When you use them on someone, they get turned into red paste. Even though the Apocryphists are the more practical weapons of the two, I always unmask Kilbane because it's satisfying seeing him flee in shame and humiliation. Kilbane's none too happy about the loss. Kilbane, it's just a match! It's my fucking reputation! This is my city. I am it, Caesar! And I get to fiddle while it burns. 
This mission is fantastic in presentation alone. The developers clearly have a lot of love for professional wrestling because they managed to nail the presentation of an actual wrestling match while still keeping in the insanity, tone, and comedy of Saints Row the Third. We feel the excitement from both the audience and commentators as three of Steelport's biggest and baddest throws down in the ring. Murder Brawl also had the potential to be a stand-in for the Fight Club activity as well. It would have been nice to engage with it outside the main story. So we've made it to the final mission of this game. The thing is that this mission has two endings that come with their own additional finale mission. Since I don't want this retrospective ending on a bleak note, I'm gonna cover the bad ending first and then finish this thing off with the good ending. If you want to see the good ending, skip to the timestamp shown on the screen. With that out the way, let's tackle the finale. Despite this mission having two different endings, it starts the same. Boss calls Pierce asking what happened to Kilbane after the match. Pierce doesn't know, but he tells us to swing by HQ since he has something important he wants to talk about. So what's up? <sighs> Heard back from Legal Lee. Studio wants you to do a screen test for gangsters in space. No, fuck that. We're done being corporate whores. So who's it? What's that? Oh, God damn it! What the hell is going on? We gotta get down there. Steelport is a complete war zone now, with fighting happening between the Luchadors and Stag at an unprecedented degree. We need to get this whole thing under control before they both destroy the city. Pierce and Oleg are tagging along, and what's really nice is that the game will allow you to leave Oleg behind without consequence. Anyways, there's three combat zones we've got to clear out, and we can tackle them in any order we want. Arriving at the first combat zone, the objective is pretty straightforward. Kill anyone standing until the red meter in the corner is empty. I don't know if I need to tell you this, but you definitely need to come to this mission prepared. Stag has their mounted machine guns and tanks out in full order, and the Luchadors will have their grenadiers standing by at the ready. Kinsey gives us a call and says that she's seeing a lot of fighting at the Sierra Point National Guard base. So we head there and bring the fight to everyone. Pierce thinks that we might not make it out of this one alive, and wants to know if there's anything we want to get off our chest. Oleg admits that he has a crush on Kinsey because it's hard for him to find someone else on his level of intellect. Okay, that's actually sweet. After clearing out the base, Angel calls us and lets us know that Kilbane is about to leave Steelport. Angel cannot let him win. There's another phone call, this time from Kia. She doesn't want to arrest us because that's gonna solve nothing. Instead, she's gonna do something else. Cyrus and Kia desperately wants to show the world how dangerous the Saints are. What Kia plans on doing is fooling everyone into thinking the Saints are domestic terrorists by blowing up Magarak Island and leaving behind the corpses of Shandi and Viola. When their bodies are found, everyone will assume that the Saints were behind this. Since this is the bad ending, Boss heads over to where Angel is at so that they can begin pursuing Kilbane. Boss is riding shotgun, and we have to swat away all enemy pursuers. Just like those two missions with Julius. We make it to the airport and chase after Kilbane's private jet on the tarmac. This is also pretty much the final Cardinalis mission, except more straightforward, and I'm riding passenger with the competent driver. Kilbane's jet is destroyed, but the walking apocalypse fittingly emerges from the wreckage. So here we are, two titans among men, worshipped by mere mortals for bringing them blood and fire. This moment was an inevitability. So's me killing you. Ah, no, 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 no. That's not how this book is written. The saint's legacy ends here, not with a bang, but with a whimper. <laughs> are you for real? It's over, Eddie. In two weeks, no one's gonna remember your name. No one will remember me. You were a fucking clown, selling energy drinks and lunchboxes. You didn't care about the crowd, just a paycheck. And I changed that. Bullshit. Mark my words. When these hands are crushing your throat, your dying breath won't be an appeal to God or a message of love to your family. It'll be, thank you, Kilbane. 
Man, I'm gonna enjoy shutting you up. So disappointingly, this is not a boss fight, it's just a series of QTEs. All this build up, everything we fought for, it all amounted to hitting or mashing one or two buttons at the right time. No cleverly designed boss fight or anything like that. That's a good question. Was killing Eddie really worth it? Was it worth losing a longtime friend and someone who greatly aided you along the way? Was it worth having the Saints being officially branded as domestic terrorists in the eyes of the public? In this cutscene, you can tell that Boss feels nothing but pain and regret for leaving those two to die like that. Getting revenge on Eddie, while justified, feels like a hollow victory where nobody wins. This wasn't retribution for what Kilbane and the Syndicate had done. This was all for Boss's ego. If Boss had let Eddie leave Steelport, we'd pretty much be the uncontested kings of the city and there'd be nothing he could do about it. Shondi and Viola died because Boss felt like he needed to score this one last victory, have the last laugh, like he wanted to have something to prove to everybody else. There's more bad news though, Monica officially greenlights use of the Daedalus. Some time later, Boss calls an intoxicated Pierce whom tells him to come over to the bar. The rest of the Saints are all having a toast in memory of Shondi and Viola. Boss also reminds Pierce to not get too lit before he arrives. We lost a lot of friends getting to where we are, and that's never easy. But at least we know that wherever Gad is, He's got friends giving St. Peter some hell, huh? To Shondi. To Shondi. They blow up every building, we're bound to be in one of them. Fuck that. We breaking their little toy. Good lord, talk about overkill. So yeah, this is the Daedalus, Cyrus's cartoonishly diabolical final solution to eradicating all the gangs in Steelport. Yes, that is correct. Cyrus is willing to level an entire city if it meant getting rid of street gangs. You know what this reminds me of? That time in Final Fantasy VII when Shinra got so frustrated with trying to hunt down Avalanche that they dropped an entire support plate on top of Sector Seven in the hopes that Avalanche would be wiped out. All they did was just kill one or two members and left presumably hundreds or thousands of innocents dead over nothing. Cyrus is doing the same thing here. Your tax dollars at work, ladies and gentlemen. So what we have to do now is speed over to Saints HQ, grab a helicopter, and fly our way towards the Daedalus. We're in the Daedalus' airspace, and the first thing we need to do is wipe out the cannons. Although some of the cannons were destroyed, Boss feels like he's not hitting this thing hard enough, so he decides to land on deck. After landing, the plan now is to plant some bombs, but that's not going to be so easy with all these enemies everywhere. The first two bombs are planted, and we need to fly to the rear deck to plant the final bomb. Kinsey also tells us that once this is over, she'll steal the Daedalus' blueprints from the Department of Defense, and we should have one of our own in a few years. Kinsey's amazing. We plant what was supposed to be the last one, but Boss understandably wants this thing gone, so he moves to another part of the deck so that he can set the final bomb. The last bomb is planted, and Cyrus flies out in his own VTOL for one last duel. 
Cyrus tries pinning the deaths of the innocent people below on Boss, which is really stupid, and when Boss refutes this, telling Cyrus that he was the one who chose to open fire on civilians, Cyrus does that stupid, oh, I didn't have a choice, look at what you made me do thing. Let's be real for a moment, Cyrus never cared about keeping Steelport safe from street gangs. This is all a power play so that he can go and be a war criminal on his own soil with the approval of the US government. If he really cared about protecting Steelport, he wouldn't be carpet bombing it in the first place. Not even Dane Vogel did shit like this. This also isn't really a boss fight either. Cyrus is just flying all over the place. Occasionally, he'll send in his goons to swarm you. The best weapon to use for this confrontation is the minigun. Oh yeah, since the bombs have started going off, you'll be left with a 5 minute time limit, so you need to finish this thing fast. Nice landing, Cyrus. Now that Cyrus is dead, we need to get the hell out of here. Boss grabs a VTOL and exits the Daedalus' airspace. The Daedalus finally crumbles, and Boss tells Kinsey to gather every saint she can find. Even in a place that is no stranger to violence, today's assault on the city stands as the blackest time in Steelport's sordid history. While the government has yet to comment on the attack, we have a report. No one runs, no one gets shot, understand? Sorry. Kinsey, you in the booth? All set. I got a message from Monica Hughes and her stooges. Dear bitch, Steelport is under new management and we don't answer to you. This is foreign soil now. Come at my city again and you'll go home in a fucking box. Back to you. Not bad. You could be a weatherman or some shit. Ah, I may have laid it on a little thick. Well, you did just create a city, State. <laughs> Good point. It reminds me. That's quite the ending. Boss raiding a news station and officially declaring Steelport as a city state, with Pierce of all people as mayor? Yeah, that's totally gonna go over well. There's a reason this ending is non canon. Well, many. First of all, you can't just hop on TV and declare whatever city you're in as a city-state. Steelport is one city in the United States. The US government can just walk right in and shut all this shit down in one afternoon and be back home in time for dinner. Yeah, the Saints have firepower and a lot of tools at their disposal, but compared to that of the US military? When you think about it, this ending is kind of a giant middle finger to Mayor Reynolds because not too long ago, he offered to help out the Saints in any way he could. I mean, sure, all of that's pointless now that the Saints have appointed themselves as rulers of the city-state, but it's the audacity that counts. One other thing to note is that Kia's all but disappeared from the story by the time this ending happens. Didn't she play a large part in bombing Magarak Island and fooling everybody into thinking the Saints were behind it? We should have gotten a boss fight with her before confronting Cyrus. All in all, this ending is terrible. Boss chooses his ego over two friends, Cyrus and the events that follow is cartoonishly evil and stupid, and the Saints designating Steelport as a city-state is such a dumb idea. Now it's time for us to move on to the good ending. We go and do the final mission like normal and this time choose Shondi over Kilbane. Boss arrives at Magarak Island and Kinsey tells us that we're gonna need the sonic boom gun in order to knock the bombs off the scaffolding. We climb the monument, start submerging the bombs, and clear out anyone standing in our way. There's eight of these things scattered throughout, and we're on a time limit, so we've gotta move fast and take down enemies quickly. There are also some saints we can rescue so that they can join us in the fight. It pays to have some extra firepower, but if any of them go down, you have to spend precious seconds reviving your homie, seconds that could have been used to scale the monument. I also want to point out that the song they use for both endings is amazing. Holding Out for a Hero by Bonnie Tyler is especially fitting since we're in the middle of trying to rescue two close allies in a do or die situation. Unfortunately, I can't play it at the risk of this video getting banned in several countries. It's also worth pointing out that one of my old retrospectives is banned in North Korea. Yes, YouTube, because I'm sure someone there is just clamoring to learn about Duel Masters. After scaling the monument for some time, Boss finally makes it to the top, confronting Kia. So this boss fight is bar for bar a clone of the fight with Veteran Child. What's also hilarious is the fact that this is the second time that Shondi's been kidnapped and forced into a boss fight like this. 
Not gonna dive into the nitty gritty of this fight, you just throw stun grenades, shoot Kia, rinse repeat, she's dead. I could go on about the fact that a decent chunk of missions in this game are modeled after ones in Saints Row 1 and 2, or the fact that Kia could have had a better boss fight, but we'd be here too long. Anyways, Kia dies, we get to witness the good ending. Let's go home. Hold it right there. Unless the next thing out of your hole is thank you, we got a serious fucking problem. They have a point, Commander. Like it or not, the Saints are heroes. Are you shitting me, lady? You declared martial law and knocked down half of the city. The Saints just saved a treasured monument. Who the fuck do you think the public will side with? Yes, I can answer any questions. Jimmy, over there. They can give you the key to the goddamn city, but as soon as you screw up, we'll be back. And next time, Stag is gonna put you down. Oh, I love you too, Cyrus. So what's the play, boss? We'll go back to banging in Stillwater? Not yet. All right, people. When we started tracking down this son of a bitch, we said we'd follow him to the ends of the earth. And we did. <laughs> Kilbane is readying his army for an all-out attack. We will stop him here. Our planet needs us. Let's not let her down. Hoorah! Hoorah! Yes, this final mission takes place on Mars. I'm at an absolute loss for words. So anyways, Commander Shepard, I mean boss, begins the raid on Kilbane's HQ in Mars. What we need to do is disable a series of force fields. I hope you weren't attached to the guns you had on Earth, because this time you're forced to use the laser weapons. To be fair though, the one that we're given has a good firing rate, but it still doesn't feel good to shoot. If given the choice, I'd still stick with my AK. Wait a minute, what's Gat doing here? Pierce gets knocked down during the raid, and when we go to revive him, he dies and then Boss lets out this dramatic ass scream. Yeah, something's definitely not right here. With the first force field disabled, Boss and crew have no choice but to press on. After disabling the second one, Shandi, well, dies I guess, leaving us with Gat. Force field number three goes down, and Gat dies. Twice. If it wasn't clear by now, this mission to Mars is actually a movie the Saints are shooting, Gangsters in Space. With all force fields gone, we're finally able to use explosives on the entrance to Kilbane's lair. We enter and finally come face to face with Kilbane one last time. So the fight with Kilbane, it's pretty much a clone of the final boss in Uncharted 2, where you've gotta shoot these conveniently placed crystals around the arena in order to deal damage. That's pretty much all you need to know about this fight. Kilbane goes down, and all is good. Roll the cutscene. I came to Mars to make a living. Keep my head down. Stay out of trouble. But I found something. I... But I found something... That... Shh, damn it. Line! Cut! Sorry, uh... Hey, you get it next time. Everybody back to one. Settle, settle, we're rolling. So this is the good ending. The Saints go through with the movie deal to film Gangsters in Space. This ending also sucks because it feels... I don't know, it feels like a terrible kind of anticlimactic. I mean, yeah, you could make the argument that the ending of Saints Row 1 feels that way too, but it was a cliffhanger that was supposed to make the player question the worth of all their effort, and so that Volition could boldly sequel bait. This ending feels lackluster because the marketing and certain plot elements built up this game's world and story to be bigger than what we got. The Syndicate is sold as this billion dollar criminal conglomerate, and to their credit they are, but the events and pacing of the plot kills that notion immediately. Everything we've gone through, all the battles fought, Johnny's death, all of it amounted to... The Saints shooting a sci-fi movie. I don't even know what else to say. As for this chapter's storyline, Stag and the Luchadors, it's also weak. 
The game makes Kilbane out to be this all-around terrible person who's ruined the lives of many. Granted, he was, but he doesn't do enough nor does he get enough screen time to warrant such a reputation amongst the crew. If anything, the only two people with justified anger against Kilbane are Viola and Angel. We also don't get enough missions battling against the Luchadors to make this rivalry feel like, oh, I don't know, a rivalry? Just like the Ultor arc, the conflict with Kilbane and his crew feels rushed, like it needed maybe two or three more missions. With Stag, they pretty much stole the show and took focus away from the gangs of Steelport and gave us two flat, yet still well-acted antagonists. Shout out to the voice and mocap actors for Cyrus and Kia. They did a good job at selling that authoritative, militaristic attitude without overdoing it. Cyrus and Kia had potential to be pretty good antagonists in spite of the over-the-top circumstances. The problem is that, as I've mentioned before, every time these two get their own cutscenes, they're always brief. The game wants us to take Cyrus seriously given how aggressive Stag was during our first encounter and because of his words during the press conference. The thing is that the most we get out of him is that he's this gruff, by-the-books, tough-on-crime army dude or whatever. Most of his cutscenes consist of him brooding over whatever the Saints have done and begging Monica to approve the Daedalus. Kia, on the other hand, is an afterthought. The only contributions to the plot she makes is arresting Shandi and planting the bomb at Magarak Island. I'm also stunned that Cyrus doesn't even bother cooking up his own revenge plot in the good ending because we just took out his second in command. In summary, the stag arc shattered this game's immersion, gave us two really boring antagonists, and delivered horribly flat endings. And that's the end of Saints Row the Third. Saints Row 3 is an overall decent game. It has its problems, trust me, but it's nowhere near as bad as fans made it out to be, especially at launch. In my opinion, the worst things about this game is the story and setting. The plot overall has terrible pacing. It goes from 0 to 100 in the first few hours of playtime without any sign of slowing down. One moment we're robbing a bank, the next we're jumping out of a plane and raiding a National Guard armory. This is all in less than a couple hours of playtime. If the writers knew when to pump the brakes, when to slow down, then I'd be more forgiving. For example, instead of having the Saints attack the armory immediately after we touch down in Steelport, have Boss and Shandi drive around the city some more. Have them visit a bar, nightclub, or whatever, and give us an exposition dump about the city itself or the Syndicate. Give the player some time to breathe for a second instead of railroading them towards another shootout. In Saints Row 2, after Boss escapes prison, the game allows you to run around Stillwater until you decide to start the next prologue mission. Hell, in Saints Row 1, the game straight up throws you into the open world immediately after the first cutscene. Steelport as a city is really boring. Very few neighborhoods have anything that stands out, and the overall scenery is dull. The most that this city has going for it is the fact that it's based off of Pittsburgh, and it's got lots of factories lining the streets. Just like the last game, I was originally gonna cover the DLCs in depth, but I decided not to. The clone DLC is just the devs treating Johnny like a joke. As for the Gangsters in Space DLC, I was really disappointed when I played it years ago because I thought that it was going to be covering more of that movie we did in the good ending. Instead, we're just running around with some random chick on a film set while she's being verbally and emotionally abused by a movie director and boss killing them in the end. Come on, Volition, this kind of false advertising is beneath you. It's literally in the title of the DLC. The last DLC, Genki Bowl 7, is pretty much more Professor Genki courses with some new obstacles. I'd hate to say it, but out of all the DLCs for this game, that's the best one. I love the Professor Genki activity, so this DLC is perfect for people like me who want to get more out of it. Overall, the DLC for this game is pretty mediocre. I wish we got ones revolving around the new lieutenants instead. So yeah, that pretty much wraps up my coverage of Saints Row the Third. Thank you all so much for watching. I really had a fun time putting this all together, and I've got more videos like these on the way. If you want to keep up with me, make sure to follow me on Twitter or Instagram. If you want to be part of a community and hang out with me and other cool people, feel free to join my Discord. If you want to support this channel through donations, feel free to donate to either my PayPal or Cash App. You can also become a channel member and gain perks such as early access to my videos, access to all my video transcripts, and priority reply in the comments. You get all these perks for only 99 cents a month if you become a channel member. Links to all of that is in the description. Thank you all so much, and take care of yourselves.